There are very few books that bring tears to my eyes. And a few years ago, I was tweeting about it. I've written an Amazon review. I was raving about it. Good cop, bad war. You may have seen Neil Woods on True Geordie podcast. You may have seen him on more recently on James English podcast. And joining the police with these honorable intentions, setting out to get the bad guys and, you know, help society, just completely humanitarian motivation. And then to get into the bureaucracy, really, of the war on drugs and to see the unintended consequences of drug laws firsthand on the front line from an ex-police officer's perspective. I think it's just such a valuable viewpoint for this podcast because we've had a lot of people on who've been to prison. We've had um, a prison guard. We've had the ex-cop, John Wedger, but we've not had someone who's been on the front line undercover in the war on drugs. So thank you very much, Neil, for coming on. Uh, my first question is then, what does it take to become an undercover cop? Uh, what does it take? Well, it took just um, a, a series of events for me. Uh, it was a, I fell into it by accident, really, because um, I, I wasn't. I was a crap cop, to be honest. I, I really was not a very good uniform cop. Uh, for the first two years, I struggled to struggled to stay in the job, and you know they can they can sack you at any point in the first two years, and I came that close so many times because I was young. I was a, just a nineteen year old. Nineteen. Yeah, I was nineteen when I joined the police. I went to university by mistake. Um, dropped out of that and then I was going to go backpacking around Europe but then ended up um, going into the police and I was naive because I grew up in a sort of middle class place went to the went to the city of Derby as a cop and I just couldn't understand why people still wanted to punch me even though I was asking them nicely not to you know what town were you from originally? Buxton in Derbyshire okay in the, in the nice town in the Peak District quite sheltered really and I read about there was a coin toss when you came to making this decision to join the police. Yeah, well, I couldn't make my mind up between going trying to go around Europe or join the police. So yeah, I flipped a coin and it came up heads. <laughs> <laughs> so you're on the beat, people are attacking you. Mm. Is that quite frequent then for a, a police person? Well, it was, it, yeah, I mean, alcohol-based violence was quite quite high at the time. Uh, it was, But I was sheltered, I wasn't used to it. You know, I wasn't used to having to grapple drunken people. I mean, I, I, I didn't do too badly, but uh, I did make quite a few mistakes. But then, uh, 1993, I got an attachment to, to the drug squad. And quite a few of us young rookies did that, which the drug squad hated, by the way. They absolutely hated it because we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, they didn't ask for us. Um, but then one of them said to me, um, do you fancy having a go at buying some crack cocaine? Which was not a question I was expecting at all. Um, so uh, he gave me 20 quid, pointed me to this blue door, and I went and knocked on this door. And this uh, chap answered. And I said, can I have a 20 pound stone, please? And he said, yeah. And he, and he, and he gave me that, and that was easy. Was so really this was easy. like a street level operation. People can just knock on the door, any old stranger and could just buy crack. Is that what it was? It was fairly straightforward, yeah, it, it was. But that day then defined the next 14 years of my life. 14 years. Yeah, because you see in 1993, you're not. Are you not old enough? You, you you're a bit younger than me, aren't you? How old? How old do I look? Are you in your forties? <laughs> Early forties. Wow. Like yeah. You're older than me. Wow. You've aged better than I have. I Drug, drugs preserve me. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so um, in 1993, you will remember then. Um, there was the greatest moral panic about drugs in the UK. Were you in the UK? Were no, the US, I'd then? left for America in 91. I was working the stock market during those years. Right. Well, you'll know the story from the other side because in the UK for years, the tabloid newspapers had whipped everyone up into a panic about crack cocaine. So every Sunday, the Sunday Mail would publish a story that black crack dealers were corrupting white people in America. That was basically the story all the time. And this is years before we had any crack. So the moment the crack hit the streets, everyone's in this like frenzy. Oh my God, this this killer drugs arrived, you know, end of society. So the Home Office responded to that and invested massively in drugs policing and instructed all of the chief constables to make drugs, in particular heroin and crack, their number one priority. And that it went above rape, above child abuse, anything. Drugs went to the number one. So the drug squad was under pressure to get results. 
to get arrests, to get seizures and prove they were doing their job. And suddenly I've knocked on a door and I've walked away with some crack just like that. So that was a new tactic really, which, um, which was invested in quite quickly. Um, but of course, first day it was quite easy. You know, the, the chap was a nice bloke really. I mean, he had a previous for GBH, fair enough, but he was very polite to me. He said, you take care, don't get yourself arrested, which I thought, which I thought was polite. Um, but the trouble is he then went to jail and he mixed with other people. And, you know, people pass on information very quickly, don't they? You learn very quickly what's going on uh, from people coming into the jail. So everybody across the UK suddenly knew there was a new tactic in town. And uh, so that nice, polite exchange at that front door was no longer nice and polite. Not just for the police, like, undercover cops like me, but for everyone else as well. And when these guys get busted then, and they get their legal discovery, does your identity then get revealed to them so they know that person who bought that crack off me was an undercover police man? Uh, eventually, at the conclusion of an operation, yeah. So in, in that case, I think there was him and just a, and a few other people involved. As soon as the, the operation's finished, you know, it's decided that it's concluded, then yes, they would be interviewed and it would be explained to them that you have um, you have sold to an undercover cop. Because different to political undercover work, that's the, the great scandal of um, the environmentalists being infiltrated by cops and that kind of thing. Very different to that, my job was always intended to end up in court. My role was always to gather evidence. So that was the end game of it, yeah. So once that is revealed, is your usefulness as an undercover cop in that area ruined? Because Word spreads fast in the criminal community. Yeah, I mean, it is. Um, although I was treated quite recklessly at, at times, particularly in the early days. Um, you know, my youth, my usefulness was considered uh, worth the risk. Um, and um, so I was overused in Derby and actually had to... I started a, a heroin job in Derby when I'd worked in the in the town before. But they thought, well, you know, everyone's in prison, there's no problem. And I saw someone I'd, I'd, I'd met on an undercover op before coming towards me. I had to, to jump into a garden and hide behind a woman pecking some washing out. Um, yeah, so there were risks. Well, in the book, Good Cop, Bad War, on the description box below this video, the links for both of Neil's books, the second book is Drug Wars, there are links in the description box below this video. You can buy the book worldwide on Amazon, paperback, um, Kindle, audio book. And also I'll put links down there for the True Geordie and the James English podcast as well, if you want to watch Neil on those podcasts as well. And links for Leap, which we're going to get to, the organization. So I'll read in the book then, as you're rising the ranks undercover, there are some violent gangs that you're assigned to infiltrate can we do those stories individually in detail yes certainly if you like okay i wasn't i didn't rise through the ranks though i was always a lowly constable um but um i, I did develop in the world of undercover work yeah yeah so let's let's start out then with one of those stories one of those gangs what was the first one that was a heavy gang that you infiltrated and first one that was a heavy gang well i mean i suppose um there was a a gang, small gang in uh, Stoke-on-Trent in Fenton, um, where I'd been buying, um, well, I'd, I'd worked up to buy buying weights of heroin. So I'd gone from 10 bags to sort of different weights and buying Henry's and maybe sometimes quarters as well of heroin off this guy. So I was quite happy with him that, um, that he trusted me. And... Um, but I remember knocking on this door, one of the four addresses that he was, that he was using, and uh, he, he opened the door. The next thing I know, he's got a samurai sword against my throat. And I thought, well, this isn't very good. Uh, well, that's probably not the words that came to my mind, to be honest. Um, but it was it, it was genuinely terrifying. I could feel that cold steel on my throat. And, you know, that I had that moment where I thought, well, this is it. Because he was, he was always a bit scary. He was a bit aggressive. But he was screaming at me, you're, you're DS. You're fucking DS. I know you are. And, and I was... I said, oh, I can't even remember what I said. I said, um, don't mean to hassle you or something inane like that. And uh, and then I heard this female voice say, I thought he was going to say he was then. 
And this 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 woman sort of stuck her head out from behind him and and just started laughing. And then they both started laughing. <laughs> It was, it was it was just winding me up or it was a test or it was a show of strength whatever it was or maybe he just had a new sword he wanted to try it out i don't know you know you got a new toy um but yeah they were just then they were just pissing themselves laughing yeah and then and then i says uh yeah can i can i have uh in fact i remember that i said can i have half a tea i was asking him for half a tea which means what half a half a tea is um a teenth is 3.75 grams. So half a tea is half of that. Um, so 1.7 something. Um, and, he, and he just started shouting at me again. There. No, I haven't got anywhere near that kind of weight. It was just a bit strange because he'd been selling me larger weights. And I said, well, can I have four 10 bags then? And he's looking at me really intently like he's going to hit me. He went, yeah, all right then. And gave me four 10 bags. It, it was a peculiar experience really. was he on drugs he was very into his crack cocaine um in fact yeah he was he was a heroin user that one a lot of the in fact almost all of the vicious people didn't tend to be users at all they tended to to be the the more serious gangsters who who whose violence is really from part of the business model uh but he was yeah he was just um he was a troubled soul so going into that situation with him then did they give you like a profile piece, all of his criminal history and what he's capable of and the dangers involved in this assignment or anything like that? At that stage, in actually, actually no, um, because there was very much um, debate at that time in terms of undercover work, whether my view of somebody I was going to come into contact with should be tainted by what I know about them and that there is a risk in terms of how I behave and the perception of how I behave that would be changed by that knowledge. Uh, and the, the the sort of the school of thought from the cover work was actually being debated amongst the few of us that did it at that time. And we were just because we were well, that was before there was any training. I had not had any training by that point. Uh, so we were just I was just making it up as I went along. And at, the, at that time, no, I wasn't told his previous convictions. Later on in operations, sometimes um, that I was told the full previous convictions and backgrounds of people. So the sword guy then, what was the name you used for him in your book? Can you remember? I can't remember the names I give people. Didn't he come in, in and out of the book a little bit? No, I don't think so. He No, he was contained to Fenton, I think. Okay. Very and much a Stoke local. <laughs> what was the what was the bust then that went down with him? Um, The bust with him. How did he end up getting arrested eventually? Uh... I think I think there was a rapid entry for all the, all the houses for, that he was in, involved in. in. Incidentally, that day when I had the samurai sword to my throat, yeah. I came away with my four bags. Yeah, and I had a cigarette packet, and I was I put them in my cigarette packet, and then as I closed my cigarette packet, then there's a knife pressing towards my stomach, with this black handle and this sharp like kitchen knife. And I look up, and this guy says, um, and he's clearly trying to rob me for the heroin I've just bought. <sighs> Which you know, it's it's not uncommon because you get you do a robbery near a dealer's house, and what you're going to do? Report it to the police. So, in if you want, if you're going to do some street robberies, doing it near a dealer's house isn't actually such a bad plan. So, it's a risk of of, of the world. Uh, but I remember looking at the knife and looking at him, thinking, "No, oh, I've just gone through too much for this. There's just no way I'm hanging, handing this over." So I just started trotting backwards, um, and he actually said to me, "No, hang on, come here a minute." I thought. No, no, I won't come here a minute. So you can stick a knife in my belly. No, thank you. But, um, you know, I I did actually look very much like a problematic heroin user at that time. But thankfully, I can run faster than one. <laughs> had you had weapons pulled on you before this situation? Actually, no. That was, I, I think that was the first time I'd had a weapon drawn on me, actually. Yeah. And the moment you've got a samurai sword to your Adam's apple, does that make you rethink your career choice? I'll be honest with you. At that time, when I was running away from the guy saying, no, just stop, come here a minute, um, I was buzzing, to be honest. I really was at that time. Um, I was. It was a huge adrenaline surge. I was quite full of myself that I'd got through it and got away with it. And uh, now that was one of the occasions where... No, it didn't put me off at all, to be honest. 
Because a lot of the guys who come in here, a lot of them have been in prison for some serious offences or some drug offences. And I ask them about their trajectory of crime. And you can see that they're addicted to playing cops and robbers. But it's interesting to hear your perspective that as a young man, you've got that same adrenaline buzz just mm -hmm. from the other side of the coin. Yeah, yeah. So how are drug gangs... Oh, let's let's go back actually to the, the time of, of Good Cop, Bad War when you're 14 years, when you're starting out. How were the drug gangs structured in this country? Well, that, I mean, that, that's been an interesting change over time and it's been quite a rapid change over time. When um, when I started, there weren't really drug gangs. Not, not really. It, it was um, loose affiliations of people who just want to do business and trade. And, and to a certain extent, that's the same now, actually. The idea of a gang is actually exaggerated by police and media quite a lot. When you look at Liverpool, for example, people talk about Liverpool gangs. Actually, Liverpool's just a collection of people who know each other and they'll shift and work with different people, you know. It might be organised because there's a structure and an exchange of money and goods, but it's a loose organisation. Now, some of the jobs I've done have been street gangs, uh, like Birmingham street gangs, where they have a very much an affiliation to a street, a postcode, that kind of thing. But generally, it's about it's about business, and unless you look at the more aggressive lower end of it. But I think the important thing is how it's changed over time and why. So as a result of police action, people band together and support each other and become a gang. And the reason for that is that the most successful dealers in the street and in the city area become the ones who are the most willing to be most violent because they're the ones who don't get grassed up. So if you've got a reputation for violence and intimidation and uh, you know, possibly the most important dynamic between any any people in in this in in and this this drug war is when someone's arrested as a dealer and they're sat in that cell and they know the cops are going to come in that cell and ask for information and that person's there is thinking oh, I've got a conviction already I'm looking at 5 years I can't do 5 years my kid's going to be too old when I come out but I know if I can grasp someone up, I can get it down to two and a half. And that's the great dynamic between the drug dealing world and police. But the important thing is that person sat in that cell thinking, who am I least scared of? Who am I least scared of that I feel like I can grasp up? And that dynamic and that thought process is actually what's driving the violence. Because all the gangsters out there know that. And so they strive to be the most aggressive so that they're not the ones grassed up in that situation. So by policing drugs and using police informants, it drives the violence in a sort of Darwinian kind of way. And you're hearing that from an ex-undercover cop, the unintended consequences of the drug war, the drug laws have made the drug problem bigger than what it really is. I've been saying this for years, but you know, people say, hey, well, he, you know, he's a trafficker, he would say these things. But now, you know, Neil's come in and said that from his own experience. What was the second time a weapon got pulled on you? Forgive me for being vague and having to think about the order of things, but it, it gets so, I, I suffer from PTSD, so sometimes okay. it, it can be, uh, remembering the order of things can be a little bit confusing. I'm having a really yeah. good day today, though, so you caught, you caught, <laughs> you caught me on a good day. I, I, I have to confess, when I did the James English <laughs> one, I was, I'd, I'd, I'd been having some real PTSD, oh, P, PTSD issues, but yeah. I don't know if, I, if it comes across on the tape because I don't watch myself. Talk, right. But, but um, so the order of things, so we don't have to get an, a, a, an exact chronological order. And what I'm looking for here is the most noteworthy times you got in dangerous situations so we can expand on those stories. Yeah, well, I suppose, um, well, Leicester, I suppose. Uh, Leicester was one of, the, one of the, probably the most dangerous one because the police, that, the, the cops that were running the operation, the team was professional but the DI running the team wasn't, and he was uh, in competition with the DI running, running another operation. And um, that that put me at some at some risk, their rivalry. And what it meant, because there was two operations going on in the region at the same time, which was unusual and unwise. But one DI decided to 
uh, end his operation and do all the busts, ignoring the fact that I was saying, look, all of this organized crime in the region is interconnected. You kick some doors in and it's going to send ripples everywhere and it's going to put me at risk. But they did it anyway, which is extraordinary cavalier attitude with my safety, really. It's the end of an operation and, and the, the most interesting gangster I'd been buying heroin off, who was very well connected. I can't remember what to call him in the book. Um, I'd not I'd not seen him for a while because he he wasn't being hands on and he was he was behind the scenes. So, but I hadn't got any um, video footage of him because when I'd been buying heroin off him, it was early in the operation and you don't you don't wear a, a wire or you don't wear a video early on until you know you can you can be trusted. So I thought, well, I need to get the footage, and there was pressure on me from above to get the video footage of this guy. So I, um, so I tempted him out by phoning him up because I knew he was really into clothes. So I got some fake Stone Island jackets from Customs that they'd seized. They were great. You can you could phone up Customs and say, "Have you got any uh, hooky tobacco or fake clothes or anything I can have?" And they just say, hey, "There you go." Um, so I had these Stone Island jackets and. Um, he was keen to meet me, and we met in this car park near the inner ring road in, in Leicester. But the trouble is he brought two of his mates with him, and these ripples had obviously gone around and there was suspicion about, and they didn't know me. Now, the guy I knew, I'd known him for six months, and um, so he was fine, but these two were just looking at me. And one was saying, yeah, so how long have you known him then? How long? I says, I've known him for months, man. There's no problem. Anyway, then sudden, then the guy I knew said, well, you just want to sell these clothes or are you after something else? And what I'm thinking as an undercover cop is I've only ever bought heroin off you. If I can buy crack off you, that's an extra 12 months in prison because it's a, the two commodities. And that's just the way you start thinking. So I'm thinking, well, if you carry in white, I'll have some white. So um, he gets out this enormous block of crack, like just massive, like bigger than a VHS thing for that he's just carrying around in the car. Anyway, sits in the driver's seat of the car and starts cutting me a little slither off for a £20 stone. But as he's doing that, his mate just suddenly pushes me up against this wall and says, and starts fiddling with my clothes. And it, I'm not wearing James Bond tech. This, this isn't high-end stuff. This is, too, you know, the year, I think the year's 2001 or something. And he finds the lump behind the, <gasps> behind the, uh, Beyond my button, and the button is like a, um, a denim jacket metal button with a little hole drilled in. So once you found it and looking at it, and there's a little glint of a, a lens there, you're not really in any doubt what you've just found, you know, especially if you happen to be looking for it. And he was just like, my God, he is as well. Man, he's heat. And so I'm thinking now, there's, this is an isolated car park. There's literally no one around, and there's three gangsters here one of which i know by by reputation is a maniac and uh, before you proceed could you tell us what you know about him that made you conclude he was a maniac well he was well connected part of what was considered was considered a gang regional gang is there uh, a name for that gang no there was they, they, they people don't necessarily go by a moniker but they were just they were just connected to birmingham i know he was connected to birmingham heads um leicester nottingham part of a, a a click and um and I, and I knew that he was he was violent it was very polite to me but i knew what his potential was so this guy he was way taller than me as well and i knew at that moment that i was in really serious trouble really serious trouble and the, and the most likely outcome of this would be me being seriously hurt or or murdered because they wouldn't want that evidence against them so now I have, you asked what it takes to be an undercover cop. Now, there, there is, there's some things that helps. And one thing, one um, thing that I have that it, well, I used to have <laughs> that, that used to be a, of great help was that if I'm in an adrenaline situation, I get a big adrenaline spike and I'm in danger, time seems to slow down for me, or well, it used to, so that I've had the feeling that um, I have all the time in the world to think. A real sort of calm clarity, which is a little bit at odds with the situation you would imagine. So I just I just knew that I had to carefully think this through to get out. And my thoughts were, I just ha basically have to prevent him from telling him 
what he's found in order for me to escape during that period of doubt. And I have to do it in a very surprising way to set him up, to, to, you know, to confuse him. So I basically just launched into it. Now, bearing in mind, I'm not an aggressive or sweary person generally, but I had to go at him in a threatening and abusive way. So I says, what the fuck are you doing picking up my clothes? It's not even my fucking jacket. I got this off Jackie this morning. So what the fuck are you on about? What are you picking up my clothes for? And repeat. And I just, I gave him a constant stream. So it didn't give him any space to tell his mate what he'd found. And he looked like shocked, like, wow, I wasn't expecting that reaction. And he had a hold of one of the jackets. So I took that slowly, folded it up really slowly, really slowly, you know, because if you're, if you're being stalked by wolves, if you run away from them, they'll soon chase you down. But if you face them, face up to them, you know, you, you, you cause some doubt. So I just did it really slowly and put it in the plastic bag I'd got it in. And then I started walking away. And as I'm doing it, I'm just giving constant abuse. What the fuck are you doing? The fuck are you doing anyway? And just, just like that. And just slowly walking. And this big car park and I'm still shouting. And I hear him shouting to his mate saying, Man, he's fucking 5 0. He's he. I'm telling you, he's fucking 5 0. I remember thinking, you're not old enough to have seen a Y 5 0. But that's, but still use the slang 5 0. But anyway, so he, but, so I got about halfway and then I hear this running behind me. I think, okay, I'm about halfway. If I, if it's just one of them, if I swing round, get, try and get a punch in and then leg it, I might just get to the exit of the car park. So I turn round, ready but it's the one I know. And he says, oh, don't mind my mate, he's a dickhead. I says, yeah, he is a dickhead, picking up my clothes and it's not even my jacket, the twat. And he says, don't you want your ting? And I'm thinking, you really want to sell me crack now? After that. So I said, uh, yeah. So I gave him the 20 quid and all the exchanges in the middle of the camera, um, his sort of smiling face and the other side. And I put it in my pocket and his mate is absolutely screaming at him. For fuck's sake, he's heat. So he starts walking back and then I carry on. And then, of course, he does manage to persuade him that he has actually found what he's just found um, quite forcefully. So then I hear the engine revving mm. and squeal of tyres. I think perhaps I shouldn't be dawdling now. And, and I sprinted. So, But I got to the edge of the car park. Now, I can just describe this. The car park went out into the sort of inner ring road bit. And then it, it led up to uh, a roundabout. And you know where how a dual carriageway in a city roundabout has metal railings to protect the pavement in a curve? I sprinted along the pavement, but the car was coming along the pavement after me. So I just got to the metal railing where there was no room for the car. And there must have been just two meters spare wow. when, I, when I glanced behind. So then they bumped onto the roundabout couple of cars squealing that they stopped and uh, and then they went around the roundabout slowly and they came around again but by that time the way the geography was there i was able to get to the away from them very quickly because i could get to a pedestrian area just beyond i think it's just beyond a kfc or whatever so i was away then um and so i carried on walking and then so i got back to the what we call the safe location the briefing spot and debrief spot got to the safe location and uh described what had happened, told him the number of the car, the description of the people. And the intel guy went away, did all his research. A few minutes later, he came back in the room laughing. He says, wow, I don't know why they just didn't shoot you. He says, there's loads of intel that there's a gun in that car. So we laughed about that, but that's sort of cop humour, really. So can you no longer, you're off that case now? Because oh, that was the end of that job, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was right at the end of it anyway. Okay. But um, but yeah, that was pulled. And it, it, But it's that, I shouldn't have been deployed that day, really. So did those guys get raided and successfully prosecuted on your evidence? Uh, only the dealer that I knew, not the other two, not the one who, made, who found the camera. Did you have to go undercover against anyone you knew had committed a murder or a gang that was involved in murder? Yeah, um, the uh, lot, yeah, others really. I, mean, I suppose the next one, there's both the next one and the Burger Bar Boys, but the next one was um, in Nottinghamshire, the, the Bestwood Cartel. 
Bestwood Cartel. Yes, um, run by Colin Grun- Colin Gunn and his brother. Um, but I've been advised not to mention his brother. Um, so Colin Gunn. Um, and um, that operation was interesting because what was going on in Nottingham at the time was there were daily shootings. It was um, an extraordinary time in the city, actually, because Colin Gunn and his, his group basically went to war with everybody else. They were at war with everyone. They were they were dominating the supply and just and just trying to get rid of the competition. Classic drug war, turf war, really, uh, but driven by the ego of of Colin Gunn. <clears throat> and it was so bad that um, the newspapers were had it on front the front pages all the time. Uh, I mean, I think my favourite headline at the time was Shottingham. But then I'm quite into puns. It's quite a good pun, don't you think? Um, And it was even discussed that the failure of Nottinghamshire Constabulary to tackle it would mean that the Home Office would take over direct control of Nottinghamshire Constabulary. That's how how bad it was. And uh, all the cops were on overtime. There was literally shooting every day happening. Every day? Every day. Every day. Just about every day, yeah. It was it was extraordinary. Shootings not necessarily had people uh, dying or being maimed every day, but there were gunshots every day. So it was really tense, and that was the reason I was sent into that area, really, because there was it was needed to try and do something to to infiltrate and find some intelligence. Now my target wasn't necessarily Colin, Colin Gunn directly; that was a little bit above my uh, low level style of undercover work. But there was lots of pressure on me to get intelligence about what was going on so i i mean i think the job just took over six months i i um spent a long time getting to know people where now, do you start well when you're working undercover you need people to manipulate and the easiest people to manipulate are vulnerable people it, it, it's a it's a brutal truth of, of undercover work absolutely but also vulnerable people, they tend to have the most connections because they're using more drugs than other people. So I, I picked on this one guy, Cammy. I picked on a few, but this particular guy was perfect for my purposes because he was a user dealer. So problematic heroin user dealing bits as a runner. Um, and he was on bail for dealing. But he was part of, he was the lower end of that organization, guns organization. That's where his drugs were coming from. So he was perfect. And I spent ages wooing him, really, you know, just befriending him. Um, and what I've called, what I tend to call it nowadays, when I look back, is is that I was weaponizing empathy, because I was, and untr- all the time I was trying to learn about the people I was around, and and that's that's how to be successful to learn about the people. But you know, so, I, so when you say wooing him. You just walk up to him and approach him and say something. Yeah. How I just do you get... initiate that? Well, I mean, I was presenting myself as a heroin consumer. So you ask, where, where can I buy some smack? That's, the, that's always your opening line, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it's got to be because uh, it's it's the normal conversation. It's quite normal to talk about heroin if you are really keen on heroin. Um, so I'd say, look, you know, I'm 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 looking to you know, looking for bees. Are you, are you are you looking for bees? And you look I look at his eyes and say. Yeah, you're ready, aren't you? Because when you're rattling or you come down with heroin, your pupils are big. And if you've just had some, they're tiny. So it makes for an easy conversation. Like, are you ready to score? You're looking to score. Uh, you know, I've only got five of you. you. Want to share a bag? Do you want to split one? And suddenly you, you you're in the same kind of realm, and you can start talking about. So stuff. Are they checking your pupils out then. Yeah, yeah. And if you've not taken the drugs, how are you adapting that with your pupils? Well, I bet my pupils look big now, despite that light, because okay. because um, <laughs> adrenaline or PTSD or various things will make your pupils go bigger than yeah. normal, or LSD will, you know. But but heroin wow. does the up, heroin does the opposite; it makes it go small. I've seen that, yeah, in prison. Yeah. yeah. So I so I um so if I, for the most part, I probably constantly look like I was rattling. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> it might have been a, might have been one of my advantages. I don't know, but but um, but it's easy to make that kind of conversation, as long as you know how to talk that way. And you learn to talk that way with empathy and you learn from the people around you. 
so I got to know him quite well and and he was a really nice guy Cammy really really nice um like mo like most problematic heroin users are to be honest he um he was clearly dealing with some kind of childhood trauma uh like like almost all heroin problematic heroin users are in fact academic evidence says that two thirds of problematic heroin users are self medicating for some kind of childhood trauma, either physical, sexual abuse or neglect. So he was clearly in that in that field. Um, and I spent I spent time with him. We went shoplifting together, actually, which um, which is really good fun. Shoplifting. It, it, it really is, though, especially if you're in if there's two of you and you can take it in turns to be lookout. And I, I remember, actually, one of one of the things I, I got away with was um, which was always a great challenge is, you know, in the th the real commodity to, to steal then, electronic commodity, was um, PlayStation memory cards. Now, people nowadays might not even remember what they are, know what they are, but they're basically a memory card which would give you extra memory for a PlayStation. And they'd be a real tradable commodity. But you went in Dixon's or Curry's, I think it was Curry's in where it was, they always had a little magnetic sticker on. So you'd have to get distract the staff or take them somewhere else in the stall to peel the sticker off. And sometimes they're really difficult, <laughs> especially if you bite your nails like I do. So they're really difficult to peel off. But that was good fun because, you know, there was a bit more effort involved. And it's like once I peeled the magnetic sticker off and stuck it to a woman's back, <laughs> <laughs> which I know was a little bit mischievous of me. Uh, mm. But, I, you know, I just got taken with a moment. But, on, but that, on that subject, if you're an undercover cop and you steal something, at the end of the day, do you have to give it back? Well, yes. Because, yes. <laughs> well, yes, eventually, eventually, yeah. Because th theft, the definition of theft is um, to appropriate something with the, the intention of permanently depriving that person of it. My intention legally was never to permanently deprive them of it because my intention would always be eventually that evidence from the evidence it would eventually go back to the store, plus any compensation if necessary for the fact that we had it so long. Oh, you know, okay. so. It's all about the intent. So I could do it legally. Not so the poor people that I was with who, if they got caught, they were shafted, essentially. So you've made an association with this guy at street level. And how do you expand it out from that? Well, um, my intent was always to get him to, to introduce me to other people. So the conversations I would have with him were... Um, yeah, the the brown we were buying off off um, hoops or, the, or or Daz or whoever, it's not bad. But I really fancy a better connect because if you've got someone who is dealing to the regional or, or local handful of street dealers, they're a step up. And the street dealers are going to skim it slightly. They'll make like, um, you know, they'll they'll make they'll make it go further, so a ten wrap slightly smaller. So. There's value in there's wherever you are in the in the market. There's value in being further up the the ladder, isn't it? You know, you get better quality, better deals. So that's that's the way I would start talking. You know, oh, I could do with a better connect. You know, what about this guy? You tell me about this guy. Uh, is you know, would he be safe? Would he be all right to get introduced to? And that's how I'd get all my information about. Oh, he'd tell me the whole story about this guy, what happened to him. And actually, this guy Stitz, as I call him in the book, who I was was the, the guy I wanted to get introduced to because he was close to Gun. Um, I remember Cammy telling me, "Oh, you ever guess what happened to Stitz yesterday? Because he actually really likes knifing people, and that's the rep that's the reputation he had. That, you know, he really into slashing people with his knife. You know, everyone has to have Albi, but that was his. And um, but this got to be so problematic that apparently Colin Gun." Snatched him off the street. This is one of his own dealers, dealers, lieutenant. Snatched him off the street, took him to the middle of a field out of the city, made him strip, strip naked, stuck a shotgun in his mouth, pulled the triggers back and said, you need to stop being so handy with that blade. And he's like, uh, okay. And um, and that was the threat for drawing too much attention to himself. With this is the man who's at, at war with everyone and shooting people. But apparently, that was the tightener he gave him. <sighs> we have a quick question then before we get to gone. You've made friends now with this low-level person, and you've gone out shoplifting, and you've scored your dope. 
doesn't that person then want to see you take those drugs in front of them? Well, I, there's always a, that's always a challenge to to not be doing that because I never had to do heroin, never used it. That would scare the hell out of me if I'm honest. Um, and I, But I, I would say that, you know, I would talk about my habit being quite small. Um, I would just do, be doing it mostly like in the evening. Uh, I would take tolerance breaks off, you know, and people do do that. It's quite reasonable because believe it or not, only 25% of heroin use is problematic. You know, we have this image of anyone who uses heroin is an addict. That's the that's what the media puts out. That's what everyone understands it. You know, the, the sort of one, one smoke and you're addicted for life idea. It's a load of bollocks, really. It's people who have a problem with emotional difficulties that have that problem. I mean, most 90% of drug use is, is non-problematic. It's just that problematic heroin use is much higher than other drugs, but it's still only 25%. So I could talk in terms of, um, yeah, I'm taking a tolerance break, mate. You know, I've, I've been I've been caning it a bit or I'm only going to do it in the evening or um, so that I could do that. But there were times through my career when people were suspicious. Someone once insisted in Brighton that he give me a blowback because I said, well, I'm, I'm doing mine later. So no, you're having a blowback. You're so having... what is a blowback? So blowback is when someone... Um, generally came to whole wrap, whole 10 wrap in one smoke, one uh, toot on the foil and then blows it into someone else and they have it from them. Um, so I went into this this toilet and he said, I said, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, no worries. Um, inwardly terrified, but I said, yeah, whatever, good idea. Um, and, he, and he blew it and I sort of looked like I was inhaling and I did the Bill Clinton, I just didn't inhale. <laughs> And I'm just thinking, please don't notice all this smoke going out the side of my mouth because I'm not inhaling it. Um, and he didn't. He was quite satisfied. So that got me out of a bit of a sticky hole, really. Well, that's a striking difference between what I was used to because I was in rave culture. I wasn't in heroin culture. But rave culture, after parties, you know, everyone's passing around the plate of ketamine or they're all in ecstasy, massaging each other. There's the rituals and the use that are part of that. It's like inherent. But you're saying that in heroin and crack culture, you could just get away with saying, you know, I just go in the toilet at nights and do my bit, but right now I'm, I'm abstaining, blah, blah, blah. You could get away with that in that culture. Yeah, well, you have to remember, people who have a problem, a real problem with heroin and crack, they are the most marginalised people in, in our society, generally. And they have to live on the streets because that's that's where they where they exist. So that actually makes it sort of easier to get away with not using drugs. Because you know, dealers don't want to be hanging around in one place to be spotted. If a dealer's suspicious, then you can fob them off one way or another because they're not going to they really are not keen on hanging around watching you uh to toot some heroin. I did have I did have one. I don't think this got into the book actually because it's just one of the things that I recall later, but there was a there was a time uh on, on the Nottinghamshire job where um, someone was, I, I got the hint that somebody was suspicious. And you know, sometimes it's the slightest hint. The guy that was with me who'd introduced me to the dealer was sat in the in a car because I was driving a car at this point in this job. He was sat on my left. And the dealer had got in the back seat to deal and passed it between the seats. Now, I knew there was great risk if the suspicion festered. So what I did is I cooked up. Because I I, took, I watched it happen plenty of times and I and I knew how to do it and I practiced it. So what is I, the procedure to cook up? So I had my spoon. I'd got a little bottle of water, uh, sterile water. Put it in the, in the spoon, tiny bit of citric, and um, put I put a third of the wrap in. Wrapped that up carefully. Uh, got my clipper lighter, cooked it up, made it bubble so it boiled. Uh, dropped the filter in. I had my uh, long orange. Um, syringe draw it up through the filter uh tapped it let it cool down to body temperature cool down for a bit chatting to him while i was waiting for it to cool down then i put my trousers down as if to go into my groin because if you're a regular injector and you go into your groin that's the one spot in the body that doesn't heal up it just stays open all the time so you, you have a lot of people where a lot of people have had collapsed veins on their arms they go into the groin because it never it never really heals up or some people go into the groin right from the offset because they don't want the collapsed veins on their arms. So I went to go in my, in my groin and then 
injected into the car seat. Wow. Um, so, but that was that was very useful for me to do that at the time because I didn't want that suspicion developing. You know, there was a few little awkward comments like asking me twice in the same day, where are you from again? That's not healthy. You've got to try and nip that in the bud somehow. When I first entered the a house of the New Mexican Mafia in Arizona, these guys were serious guys like AK-47s and all these guns, slabs of meth, slabs of cocaine. And one of the brothers had brought me over who I was cool with, but they saw me, this, you know, this, this, this pale English man just walking into this house. And they're all like, mm, just like they wanted to kill me or eat me at least. Mm. So this massive one, all, all the prison tats on and the chain just swings this spoonful of coke in my face. He's like, snort that. And I look at the, the brother who's brought me over G-Dog. He's like, yeah, snort that. So I just snorted it up. And um, that was it, because they want to do this test to see if you're taking the drugs, isn't it? Mm. If I hadn't have snorted it, I probably would have been taken out to the desert. Well, I mean, that, that sort of happened to me, sort of, um, with... Um it was a, a more of a, a, a ravey environment, I suppose. It wasn't an actually heroin and crack job specifically, although the dealer I was after was dealing crack and heroin. He was also an antique burglar, a car thief, big, big player. And it was in a, it was the weirdest location though, this uh, village pub in Wittick in Leicestershire, but it just happened to be the meeting place of all the region's gangsters. It was, it was the most peculiar thing, you know. I couldn't quite believe it when the intelligence was explained to me. I thought, you're having a laugh, aren't you? It is ridiculous. It's like some kind of cartoon or something. Like John Gotti's social club. They're all right there. Yeah, it was it was bizarre. It really was. Anyway, the, this this big big fish there. He I'd been befriending him, but I made a really really stupid mistake. Really stupid mistake with that operation. I made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines. It's just a summit to talk about, you know, because I knew the different types and the reasons why things would be different, you know. Metham methamphetamine and benzodrine and etc. And um, anyway, he fell for it because one day after I'd known for a few weeks, he says, "Hey, you got you a present," and he held out this bag, and it had this pink, toxic-looking goo in it, and it looked like you could see the bag, the plastic bag, even dissolving in front of your eyes. You know, and it smelt like the urine from a glue sniffing cat <laughs> really brutal urine type sort of nasty <laughs> chemical smell um and i must have had just a moment's reticence very fleeting passing look on my face and at the moment that that happened i saw he'd seen that mm -hmm. and i could pick up on that instant and i knew because he was a very violent character i'd seen him order someone uh, a beating for someone for 10 pound debt and i thought I've got to dive in here. I've got to show some enthusiasm now to, to, to offset what he's just seen. So I said, yeah, okay. And I dipped my finger in, put my little finger in a little bit and put on my tongue. And he looked at me and said, you're going to want more than that with your tolerance. Thinking, right, okay. So I dipped in and put a load more in. And I sort of felt the mouth also forming instantly, you know. Um, and and, and when, it, when it hit my stomach, yeah, it was... It was quite an intense rush to, to be honest um, and I got out of there tried to write some evidence up and uh, but I had to I had to be driven home it was an, it was a horrible experience to be honest it was really anxiety inducing um, the average purity of speed at the time was 5% this was 40% so it was proper it was proper base um, but I knew enough about the drug that I wasn't going to overdose I just probably going to have an unpleasant time um and i knew when i was being driven home i was thinking i've got eight cans of stella in the fridge at home and i'm thinking that's going to calm me down and it didn't touch the sides at all it made no difference whatsoever which is quite surprising yeah i was i didn't sleep properly for three nights oh jesus but my house has never been so tidy <laughs> So how is the gun case building up then from the street level? Well, eventually I got in, I got an introduction from Cami to um, Stitz and um, I went, I met up with Stitz. He drove to meet me. Cami wasn't there. I was on my own. The intros were by, by phone. So I got there and um, he's, in, he's in this car and in the front passenger seat is 
his son, who I find out is his son, who's 12, I believe, 12, 13. And he's wearing an identical tracksuit to his father. Absolutely identical. They've both got shaved heads. Um, and it was just so odd. I'm thinking he's brought it like a mini me with him. <laughs> so, so weird. So anyway, he started interrogating me and saying, who, who do you know? How, how do you how do you know to speak to me? I says, well, you've just spoken to them on the phone. They've just explained to you. And, oh, right. And who else do you know? And it just got to the really bland kind of thing. But then he opened the door and he put a, bl a blade into my bollocks. Ooh. And I could feel the steel, and it's and I don't recommend it at all. It's it's a most uncomfortable feeling, quite off putting. Um, so he asked me the same questions again and gave me a real grilling, and it felt like it went on for a hell of a long time, but probably probably went on as long as ten minutes or so. With minutes. the blade against your bollocks yeah. the whole time. Yeah, yeah, <sighs> yeah. But I remember thinking, looking at the kid, like. This child is seeing this. This child is, is this is this child's development. You know, this is what he's seen his dad doing as he brought his child with him specially to show him that this is how you behave, you know? Um, yeah, it really, really stuck with me that. Um, but eventually uh, he was happy with me and, um, and I bought off him. And then uh, that was quite a breakthrough really because he was one of the most, he was someone we really needed to get. Um, but he was never he was never relaxed with me really it was always every time i met him it was um, nerve inducing um and by this time the thrill of adrenaline surges was starting to wear off <laughs> if, if you get my meaning that was that was tiring you know that was um i was exhausted after that really exhausted on very on edge and that was four and a half months into that job at that point Four and a half months I'd got to get that introduction. Next day I went into, um, it, we had the morning briefing and we'd been working with no, with no days off for a long time and two of the backup team went off sick. So I got two new replacement cops. First one when I met him, no problem at all, shook his hand. Second one, shook his hand and, and just the hairs went up on the back of my neck. And you know when you've been when you've been working undercover and you've um, you become very sensitive to body language and and you know you're feeling almost paranoid really, and this guy just screamed wrong. You know it, it was the, such a reaction I had. Perhaps the way that he looked sideways into the floor instead of meeting my eyes when he shook hands. I don't know what exactly, but it, instinct screamed. So yeah. I said to the boss, "Look, I can't have this guy knowing what I'm doing. I can't." I'm not comfortable with him. So I said, well, we'll exclude them both so they don't ask any questions and just tell them to park up at the edge of the city. So I didn't think much more of that after that. So just after six months, uh, the job concluded. Loads of people arrested. Um, some gangster types like Stitz. Lots of vulnerable people as well. Were you ever introduced to Gone before the arrests? No, I've never met him. It, he wasn't actually arrested as a result of the conclusion of my job, actually. Uh, my job provided intelligence for another operation, a uh, very good operation by Nottinghamshire Constabulary, which brought him down a few months later. So one thing led to another. So I never got to that level with that, with that job. But when he was brought down, less than a year later, gone, it turned out that the cop that I was uh, suspicious of had that reaction to um, was an employee of Colin Gunn. He'd been paid by Gunn to join the police uh, with the instruction of working his way into CID. He was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages, plus bonuses for good information. Now, in the debrief for that operation, when I spoke to some senior covert police, the attitude from from the senior police was, well, Woodsy, we know this happens. Of course this happens. With this much money involved, how can it not happen? So, and I've spoke to many senior police since, including some chief constables uh, that I've got to know. And 
they all agree that this is inevitable, that this ha does happen, you know, that they have been privy to potential intelligence that this does happen. And I can point to constabularies around the UK, you know, there's um, perhaps a little unfortunate to pick on GMP, uh, but, you know, there is significant intelligence of police corruption there that, to my mind, has never actually been dealt with. Or if you if you look at um, the Met, the London, um, again, there's massive intelligence and details about corrupt corruption there that, that's never been actioned because you can't. The, because the drug war, the corruption of the drug war makes it too endemic and too powerful. We had John Wedger on, ex-cop, and he was talking about when he first was doing these raids in London on the drug dealers, the police would just hand out the spoils amongst each other, the, the, the cash and stuff, and just keep it. Just um, as an aside here then, I've mentioned on previous podcasts how this illegal market in black market in drugs just gets bigger and bigger every single year. And the very thing that Neil just described there's this vast amount of money, so much money available that they can send people to join the police. And that is because of drug laws. Drug laws have created this situation. From writing about Pablo Escobar, he could source his coca paste for $60 a kilo in the late 70s because of drug laws. Back then it was going for $60,000 a kilo in America. It doesn't matter who they arrest, Escobar, El Chapo, that drug money just keeps flowing and it just gets bigger and bigger every single year. And until the politicians and the legislators put hand, put drugs back in the hands of doctors and decriminalize and legalize, then that record amount of profits for the gangsters is always going to be available. It's the biggest gold rush in the history of the world for gangsters mm. to be able to make money is the drug market created by drug laws. So, absolutely. And can can I just add add a certain dynamic to that? Yeah. That's um, it's it's not just actually the value in the drug market that's the problem. It's the fact that by policing the drug market, we create monopolies. Now, the unregulated drug market is like the ultimate capitalist nightmare. There's no regulation and no control at all. And as any economist knows, that in any unregulated market, monopolies appear. They do. But the trouble is, by policing the problem, police are helping the monop create the monopolies and make them bigger. Because what what police do, they just they get rid of the competition, they thin out the competition, and actually gangsters use police informants to do that, to get rid of the competition. And the problem is, when a monopoly grows in organised crime for drugs, it means they have a bigger slice of the pie. And if they've got a bigger slice of the pie, their ability to corrupt the system is improved. So by policing drugs, we cause the corruption. And the other thing you've pointed out is that the gangsters react to the measures that the police take mm. so you start this undercover stuff and then the gangsters start having to increase their violence to intimidate the street level people into not snitching on them yeah exactly and how does that keep going well it's a, it's a never-ending arms race the police the police are actually really good at catching drug dealers Really, really good at it. You know, if you gave them twice the resources, they'd catch twice as many. But all it does is superheat the violence because it, it creates that Darwinian situation that the most successful gangster is the one who's less likely to be grassed up, but also the one that is less that, that can intimidate people not to introduce an, an undercover cop to them. You know, it, the environment for undercover work just becomes more and more hostile all the time. In fact, that played out with um, the Burger Bar Boys, if you'd like me to tell you oh, yes, please. about that. In detail. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd given up um, undercover work after the Nottinghamshire job because Cammy, who I befriended, when he was arrested, he ended up uh, being on suicide watch. And that's not because he was scared of going to jail or any other reason. It was because I betrayed him because he thought I was his only friend in the world, the only, literally the only person he could speak to. Just to give a bit, bit of background then, because we talked a lot about the gangsters. When you're going in and you're meeting Cammy and you, you, you start spending a lot of time with these people, don't you? And you learn their sad stories and their histories. And can you, can you, could you perhaps describe Cammy's personal story, or his history, or, or any of the people that you met around that time? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I knew other people's in much more detail, to be honest. Camis, I, I only knew uh, briefly, but 
he found that, that I was someone he could talk to about the way he was feeling. And and uh, so he saw me as his number one friend in the world. But there was there's another example, a woman in, in Northampton who I remember one day, actually, I, I played rattling because sometimes you know you can't just be the person with the money all the time. So I turned up, no money, I'm rattling today. And I could act it quite well. And she looked at me this morning. She says, uh, hey, mate, you're hanging out, aren't you? You're hanging out, you're rattling. I says, yeah, yeah. And I was all like hunched, like I've got stomach cramps and stuff. And she, uh, she put her hand in my pocket and gave me five quid. I says, so yeah, but mate, you're going to want that, aren't you? She says, yeah, but I'm all right for the next four hours. So that's the, what pure generosity is that, that at that moment, her perception was that I needed it more than her, at least for the next four hours. Is there a more pure generosity than that? And she, she, was, she was a lovely uh, woman. Um, but I learned a lot about her history and she said that I can do my rattle, I can stop taking heroin and I do sometimes for a tolerance break. But the trouble is when I stop taking it, I get suicidal because I remember the sexual abuse that my uncle used to give me. I can remember the, thing, the feeling of his fingernails. And so for her and so many other people, heroin is a very powerful painkiller of the body. It's also a very powerful painkiller of the mind. So actually her taking heroin was a very rational decision. It was actually keeping her alive and preventing suicidal thoughts. And um, for someone who's so generous to other people, you know, that's just, it's, it's just horrifying that she's abandoned by the state to struggle on the streets with that, with that problem. Because when I was a kid, I was raised with images of heroin addicts, people living under bridges, like zombified people who would just go out and with knives and stuff and rob people at ATMs or do shoplifting and they'd all the day rolled around getting high and these people are like really demonic people. Now, I end up in prison in Arizona where 90% of the prison population was injecting heroin or crystal meth. Two thirds of deadly diseases like hep C. So even though they had the yellow jaundice skin, the teeth rotting out, they knew they were going to die. Mm. The whole day just revolved around getting the, the drugs into the prison and getting high. So I'm perplexed seeing this and in shock seeing this when I first go in but over time as I gain their trust and they tell me their stories mm -hmm. thrown away as kids raised on the streets molested like you just described yeah. seeing the parents die all these absolutely horrific things had happened to them and I thought you know I had a good education I had a good family support and I committed these crimes and look at the situation these people and it made me feel doubly guilty for committing my crimes so then i started to help them a third of them couldn't even read or write i'm doing um you know basic literacy classes helping the mexicans to write home in spanish and stuff like that and um even to this day you know people sometimes say because i started a blog i started writing what was going down down in this jail even the guards are murdering mentally ill prisoners in, in one of the facilities and people sometimes say you know why do you want to help prisoners the pedophiles, rapists, murderers. And I say, look, I felt that before I got arrested because that's all the media reports is extreme crimes on one side. Mm. And how easy it is on the other. They got the PlayStations, they got gourmet food, they got luxuries. Yeah, there are pedophiles, murderers, rapists in, in, in prison. And, and, and prison, that, that's what prisons are for. They belong in there. I was a drug trafficker. I belonged in there. But, what I, <laughs> but what I saw was that the... The average arrest was just a low-level drug user. Massive amount of people getting arrested for weed possession back then. Black kids, Mexican kids with little bits of weed getting two to five year sentences. Mm. And then they graduate to heroin in the prison. They're so scared they click up with the gangs. Yeah. Get these racist tattoos and eat swastikas on their faces and stuff. And they're ruined. And again, it's all a function of the war on drugs. I watched one of the Leap speakers is it Peter Christ or Chris or something like Peter that? Peter Christ, yeah. Peter Christ. Yeah, he's amazing. And he's, he, he just nails it, doesn't he? He says, prisons and the police will for, take person A out of society who harms person B. Murderers, robbers. And if you go back years, that's how crime has been defined. Hmm. A low-level drug user, a kid with weed, who's that person hurting themselves? Hmm. Debatable again. Cry, cry for help, I think, for a lot from a lot of them because of the suffering that they're going through. Mm. Give them mentorship, send them over to mental health. Um, it, but we're putting them in prisons where we're just exacerbating the situation. Yeah. But, I mean, I, 
you know, you say the young person using some weed or something. I, I mean, we have to. I have to say, now that I've gone on a complete journey, I think it's important to say that drug use is normal. It's very, very important to say that, and it can't be said often enough. Ninety percent is non-problematic. The problems are caused by the drug laws. Um, so yeah, I mean, the young person using some weed, it's normal behaviour. You know, it's not necessarily self-medicating for anything. Most people do drugs because they're fun or they help them relax you know so it's harm reduction you're never going to stop people taking drugs yeah exactly Precisely. harm reduction is required yes but the drug laws just throw that out the window yeah exactly they do yeah so burger what were they called the gang the burger bar boys how did they get that name um it was a, a burger bar where they used to meet i think <laughs> <laughs> just just in, 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 in Birmingham. Um, and they had a rival gang, the Johnson crew, uh, fam famous rivals. And that, that rivalry has meant in some all sorts of murders, a very high profile double murder of uh, two two women, uh, Charmaine Harris and Letitia Shakespeare, uh, who were machine gunned in the street. What was the reason that they did that? Miss, they, they thought they were someone else, I think. Um, it was just uh, someone. Con they thought there was someone connected with the Johnson crew and needed needed murdering. Um, what were the roots of this gang? Um, well, some of them are second generation or were second generation um, dealers, so that you know they've been brought up in, into the lifestyle in a in a family sense, um, which is a terrifying dynamic of the way that the drug war is going to play out. Uh, we're in the third generation now, as, as we call it, in drug wars. What, what's going to happen with the fourth? You know, we've got 10,000 children being exploited by drug gangs to deal drugs. But how are they going to be influenced as they grow up? You know, it's, it's a terrifying prospect. So, I mean, that the, there was it was quite a large gang. Um, one of them, I can't remember what I call him in the book, but I'll, I'll call him, I'll call him uh, Junior. He was the person who sourced the gun for that double murder, and he was in the car, and he was the only one who didn't get prosecuted. Four of them did. Um, and he was the guy who was leading the gang of six Burger Bar boys who had, who had taken over the supply in Northampton. So he was implicated in seven different murders in Birmingham, and he was seen as a um, Burger Bar boys enforcer type character. And he'd, he'd taken over Northampton. And the way that they took taken over Northampton is a classic story. Northampton police had had some success against their local dealers. And the big gang from the big city stepped in and took over. You know, you, the, you, the gap in the marketplace, it's just the way business works, isn't it? You know, Richard Branson calls it, calls disruption good for business. And, you know, where, where does that play out more than the drug markets? So they took over Northampton. And that's when I got called in. Because... Um, they said, well, Woodsy, we need you to do this one. Because I'd given up undercover work at this point because I found Cammy and all that really too too distressing. Uh, but they persuaded me to, to do it. And they said, look, Woodsy, you need to do this because these are even more vicious than the last lot. Uh, they're using rape as punishment what? and reputation building. You know, if, you, if you've got a sister or girlfriend and you've got a drug debt, then they're going to get raped. Or um, there were maimings. They were just unbound brutality it, it, it really was so um and and in fact what one of the days um one of the days when i had got to know them that there was i i remember being briefed in the morning that there was a rape had happened a gang rape in the car that i'd been getting into so that that morning if i did get into the same car and i came out again then i may well become part of the crime scene so we had to have a strategy for then getting my clothes all bagged up just in case, because if she reported it, then they wanted to have some chance of some evidence. But of course, she didn't report it. Who goes up against the Burger Bar boys? So um, so that's the kind of, you know, that was the backdrop to what their behavior was as, as we were working. But I had to, because they, were, they weren't necessarily hands-on, they were mostly wholesale for, for the town. And there were six of them running the business. I had to work really hard to get an introduction to them directly. Um, so what I did is I picked on two people uh, who were a couple, man and a woman. They were both problematic heroin users, both supported each other, quite a good couple. Um, she was really good at selling the big issue. She'd be there 
from eight o'clock every morning outside the Marks and Spencers in Northampton. And he was quite a good shoplifter, which is quite weird because he walked with a crutch. He had chronic pain and an injury in his leg. But they supported each other. They had set up a dealing, but they were unaffiliated. So they got grassed up. So in other words, the burgers used a police informant to shut them down to get rid of the competition. They were lucky that that's the way they tackled it, I suppose. So they were on bail at the time. Um, so I picked on them because they were well connected. And so I got them to introduce me to all the stolen property handlers, you know, to anyone who would take spirits, anyone who would take electronics, anyone who would take baby clothes. Baby clothes is massive. But I suppose they grow up so fast, don't they? So there's always a demand for baby clothes and child's clothes. Um, so I was like shoplifting or pretending to shoplift that and selling them stuff and and then winning them over by, if I had any spare property left, like if I'd say I'd sold a load of DVDs and I had some spare, I'd, I'd just give them to them as present. And I really got on with them really well. They were, again, they were really nice people. And but I was always moaning, saying, you know, I can only get these crappy ten bags off this guy or this guy. You know, I could do with doing some weights and maybe setting myself up as, you know, taking some weights out of the city and selling where the you know, where it's safer to do it. So um eventually they said, Yeah, all right, we'll introduce you to the Brummies, because they were well connected with them. Despite well, I don't think they realised that the Brummies had got rid of them in the way that they had. Um but they introduced me and um, it was a really weird experience being taken to their sort of headquarters and they set up, they held court in the local snooker club in the centre of town. Um, and it was very, very odd because he's walking there alongside me with a walking stick and we're going towards it and he's made me learn a cover story because I'd only known him a few weeks. And he says, no, these, if I'm introducing you, we've known each other for years. So we need to say where we've known each other from, what we've done together, who else we know. And he's making me learn all these names and places. And I'm thinking, God's sake, you know, let me just remember my own cover story. What are you trying to do to me? <laughs> Turning me schizophrenic or something. <laughs> so that was a bit uncomfortable. Uh, and then we went into the snooker club and we were directed into the gents' toilets straight away. And the door, the door burst open and this hooded figure came in, um, went into the cubicle, stood in the toilet and looked over the cubicle and said, What's this? And the door burst open again and these four hooded figures came in and they started walking around me. And as they're walking around me, then they occasionally headbutt me, like on the side of the ear. I don't know if you've ever been battered on the side of the ear, but it really hurts. Um, and it's quite surprising too. And so I'd be pushed, headbutted one way and I'd be pushed another and butted next. Um, and while this is going on, he's asking me questions and then he's asking him questions. And then he's rephrasing the questions and testing me a little bit. And I knew the reputation of these people and I knew they would, they would be likely to just casually leave me in a mess. And I just became quite convinced I wasn't leaving that in one piece. I thought I'm going to have a really serious beating here because it's what they do. And it the, the sort of the feeling of impending violence was almost tangible. It was really tangible in the air. Are you completely at risk in these situations whereby you've got no backup monitoring the situation. For example, if I don't come out in 10 minutes, you guys raid this snooker hall or you haven't got a panic button or any way to... No, I think actually for for that operation, I actually think I had a smartphone, which was an open mic, but um, I, I would never be comfortable with backup being close to me because that, for my mind, makes me more at risk. I can account for my own actions, but I can't account for the actions of somebody else. So no, I generally was just on my own. So anything can happen. So anything can happen, yeah. And even if I did have the smartphone on, because most a lot of the time it didn't work. Even if even if I just had a smart, smartphone on, and anything's going to happen before any backups come in anyway. So it makes no difference. So I'd rather not have anyone nearby to to risk risk me. Um. So um. So yeah, I, I thought I was going to get a beating, and all of a sudden it just stopped because he said, "All right then, what do you want?" And in almost choreographed fashion, as soon as he said, "What do you want?" they just went out in single file. Um, and I said, oh, I'll have one on one, please. Uh, which is 0.4 of heroin, 0.4 of crack, 20 pound each. Gave him my 40 pounds and and uh, said, can I have your number? I put a number in a phone and, and that was it. I was into them then. Um, 
that was the most difficult moment just to get that introduction because once I'd got that number, then the, all six of them operated from that. And I say they were wholesale because they were running all the runners and other people in the town, but they were also hands-on as well. They were doing both sides. You know, they were they were busy people making a lot of money, and they were very good at making it as well. Um, but but yeah, they, but they were pretty brutal. Do you have stories of their brutality other than what you described with the rapes? There was one day I'd started wearing a camera uh, to get evidence of them, and uh, I think I'd been wearing a camera. I, th I think for at least a week. But this one morning, one day when I, when I finished seeing them, and I think one of them said, why why are we always end up meeting you here? So I thought, there's a little bit of suspicion here. There's some, something going on. So the next morning I thought, mm, do I wear the camera? Do I not? And I thought, no, nah, I'm not going to. No, no, I'm not going to wear it today. Anyway, when I met, expecting to meet one of them, I met five of them. And then I think four of them put me in this big, vehicle and drove me it wasn't a massive distance but drove me to the edge of the race course which is a park in the center of northampton and there's a bit where there's a path go there's some roads which sort of lead onto it and they took me up to one of those dead-end roads and took me to the edge of the park amongst the trees one of them lifted his shirt up and showed me a gun tucked into his um trouser top it was tracky tracky top and he says right straight white boy Come on, you're five oh. Again, I'm thinking you're definitely not old enough to have seen why five oh. You're a child for fuck's sake. Um, but it says five. You're five oh. You heat. You know we know you are. You where have you come from? Where have you come from? And uh, they made me strip naked in the in the day at the edge of the racecourse park in in Northampton. And I was very very happy. I'd not worn that worn that camera that day. Very very happy indeed. Because I was almost smiling, like this. This is fucking terrifying, but it could be a lot worse. Do you think they would have shot you? I, I, most of the gangsters and people I've met have had an exaggerated reputation and have some, um, some common sense and a sense of how they could make things worse. These guys, I think, had no idea. I think they would definitely have shot me. I think they would have not thought about the long term circumstances i thought they would have be quite sure they could get away with it um so yeah i think i was genuinely at risk because with the story of kiki camarina which is in my upcoming book we are being lied to he was undercover da in mexico and his attitude was they won would not dare kill a u.s agent so he's, he, his wife was like trying to get him transferred back to America. And he's like, no, you know, because the violence was getting out of control of the cartel. He was just saying, look, they won't kill a US agent in Mexico. They won't do it at that level. They'll kill each other, but they won't kill a US agent. And he was wrong. And that's, um, mm -hmm. that, that's um, went right to the top of the cartel that they would, with, with the retaliation that came from the US government. But I've got a quick question for you um, before we keep going with the burger stuff you mentioned earlier that the police are very good at arresting drug dealers hmm. does that therefore mean that the mafia or the cartel ultimately are perfectly designed to maintain and monopolize the drug business because all the low level people just get wiped out but something that's got the infrastructure of a cartel can just keep going well, yeah, absolutely. But I wouldn't even say that it's the infrastructure of the cartel maintains it because it's it's simpler than that, really. It, because it doesn't matter what level it is, whether it's the lowest street dealer, middle management, regional dealer, or even a whole cartel. If you arrest them, if you stop them, all you do is create an opportunity for somebody else, whether that's another cartel at the top, another street dealer at the bottom. So police are fantastic at catching drug dealers. And sometimes, sometimes, occasionally, they'll even catch some high up people, sometimes. Uh, but they don't reduce the size of the market. But they do change the shape of the market. And over time, that changing shape that's caused by policing um, has got more brutal and uglier. So after this situation with the burger bar, boys, did you go back to wearing the wire? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, I didn't report the search because I didn't want the job to be pulled. And that's something I learned quite on, earlier on with uh, undercover work. Sometimes with the complicity of my handler or sometimes with the complicity of an investigating team member. You know, the first time I saw a gun, 
actually in Derby, did, I started writing it up on my notes and the, the, the DC said, well, you can write that up if you want. You can put that in, yeah. But we're not going to find the gun, are we? Unless we go looking for it now. And do you think we'll find it now? Right. And when we do, and we haven't got any evidence, and we haven't got any evidence of dealing, what do you think will happen? So then the penny dropped. I had to just keep going and not report. You report it, the job gets pulled. But if you keep going, you get evidence. So, so even the mechanisms of how this is investigated from the police point of view, I was breaking the rules. I was breaking the rules so many times. I was doing it for noble with noble intent, but the rules being broken in order to try and catch people. I even I even AP'd somebody once, uh, which means agent provocateur, which is the absolute no no, the absolute golden rule of undercover work. You do not um, use an agent provocateur technique. But this guy, sorry to go off on it. No, you're sorry. fine. You've got we've got all the time. You just keep expand. Um, this um, th this guy in Dar. It, well, was it Derby, Leicestershire? This guy in Leicestershire was burglaring houses uh, of old women. He was also an amphetamine dealer. They couldn't catch him, but they had clear intelligence that this guy was going into old women's bedrooms to, to steal from them, and it was terrifying them. So they couldn't catch him for the burglaries, but they thought, well, let's see if we can get him for the dealing. So I went in, and he was only a pisspot dealer, really. But I talked him up because he was an obnoxious and foul creature. He really was. I talked him into, I was saying, look, mate of mine's just been let down on a kilo, uh, some coke um, and other stuff. And um, I talked him into, he was saying, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, I can, I can do it. But it was beyond his capabilities. It was, and I was quite sure it was. So when we raided him, we got this kilo that was, that was like 0.5% pure. He just got an ounce or something and like bashed it down. <laughs> Yeah, I'm capable of a kilo, you know. But so, so there he was in court for for this trying to sell a kilo, and that's not actually the reality. And he never was capable of it. So really, I'd I'd AP'd him, I'd I'd, I'd uh, enticed him into committing an offence that he wouldn't have otherwise have committed, or a more serious offence, which is wrong. You know, it is wrong. Uh, it's in the basic instructions for undercover work that you don't do that. But. Um, but you believe that was for the greater good because of what he was doing. Yeah, you call it noble corruption. But, you know, if, if I was still in the job, I could be sacked for admitting that. So where is the line drawn in this country then between the quantity of drugs you're arrested with and the purity? Well, a good solicitor might have sorted that out and got him to to make an issue of it. But he pleaded guilty. And, and um, that would appear... I don't know the discussions that went on between him and his solicitor, but that would appear to be very poor advice, really, because um, because if he'd just taken a bit to look at it or understand, you know, a solicitor maybe didn't, maybe didn't understand that that was utterly ridiculous, because that's not a kilo, is it? It's not a kilo; it's an ounce at best, you know. So um, yeah, at best. So it's just the way the legal system often works. And. Um do the police sometimes establish themselves as undercover sellers? And what's the purity of the drugs they would use in that case? No, you never get any, never, not in this country. I know they have some weird ways of doing stuff in America that confuses the hell out of me. But no, no, you, you never, never pose as sellers. I mean, I pretended to be a mid-level dealer when I was buying to say I was going to be then selling it on elsewhere plenty of times. Um, but you don't supply you never supply is always supply supply is always unlawful i see okay okay so going back to the burger bar then you're back you've got your wire back on now how are your interactions with them now completely back to normal they were absolutely fine and, and a bit cheeky actually um like, like they were happier with me so so one day i'd, I'd phone up and say uh it'd be my second buy in the day and I said, yeah, can you do his one-on-one? -on -one? And they'd go, uh, oh, you're such a bad boy. Yeah, yeah, man, you can have one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah, and right, quite quite friendly with me then. It was a bit strange. And then a few days after that, or a couple of weeks afterwards, I remember getting in the car, because they generally, one would be driving in the front or two in the front and driving someone in the back, and you'd get into the back and the guy at the back would serve you up. So I got in this big car with them one day and this absolute fog of gang smoke 
fog of weed smoke came out of the car. It's like, Jesus Christ, it's some kind of weird hot box or something. <laughs> and um, they were not, they normally were really sharp and dead professional and they didn't use any drugs at all. But this day, they obviously decided to get absolutely caned. I mean, I went, I went, I went in, sat next to him, and he's looking at me like through almost closed <laughs> eyes. And he looks at me because, and weirdly for this operation, almost as a sort of um, a weird bolstering of my own courage somehow that I decided to use a cover name similar to my own. And this was a reaction to how close the corruption was in the previous job, if you know what I mean. It was me taking the, like, taking the piss out of the system that, well, if I've got undercover cops on my backup team, potentially. It was my sense of humour at the time. But anyway, I was for that job operation, I was being known as Woody. So I get in the back of this car and he's looking at me with the eyes closed and he's looking at me and saying, Woody man, why they call you Woody man? Is it because you looks like Woody Allen man? <laughs> I'm thinking, well, I wouldn't have said so, but I'm thinking. So I came out with this bizarre story, <laughs> which I just sometimes you just go thinking on your feet and go with it. And I says, well, no, actually, it's it's because of what when I was younger, some some of my mates used to call me. Um, see, I had skin cancer on my head, just there, and it was, and I had to have it lasered off. And I said, you can probably still see the scar. And he went, oh yeah. So I said, uh, yeah. So it's, it, you know, I don't know if the scar's gone, but maybe it's a bit there. But I had to have it lasered on my head. Now, do you remember the to the film Toy Story? I said, and he went, oh yeah, yeah. Obviously, a Toy Story fan. Um, I says, well, you remember when the naughty kid picks up Woody and he burns his head with a magnifying glass? And he went, yeah, yeah. I says, well, I had my skin cancer at the time that Toy Story was out. So my mates saw that and found it funny and took the piss out of me and they called me Woody because of the skin cancer and it's stuck ever since. <laughs> and this seven times murderer gangster from Birmingham looked at me and went, oh man, that's so mean. <laughs> which just goes to show really you know perhaps when he was 14 15 he didn't think he'd grow up to be a murdering gangster and it actually had some humanity behind all of that when you say seven times murder then what yeah. do you mean by that the intelligence said he was implicated in seven murders in Burnham. seven murders mm. and you said earlier that they protect you against that information so when you're going in oh did, earlier did you know, on did you know that on this I, case i know all of i knew all of their intel for this one I, 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 I wanted to know, and the ruling was that I could know. Yeah. And do you know anything about the murders that he'd committed? I don't know. I mean, some of them were rival connected with the Johnson crew. I do know that. It was part of their war. Well, um, who were the Johnson crew? Johnson crew were a rival, a rival gang that they were at war with for a long time. Um, and another uber-aggressive um, uh Gang in Birmingham, I think the John, the name Johnson Crew comes comes from Johnson Close, where some of them some of them lived. So it was um, very much a postcode kind of gang culture, really um, loyalties and regional sort of territory. So the Burger Bar Boys have accepted you back in the crew now, and they're acting cocky with you. You said that you actually called them on one of the occasions and and discussed the whatever it was, the deal. Are you obtaining wiretap phone call information as well as recording them on your little camera? Because my case, it was all wiretaps was the main evidence. Uh, I did do some recordings, uh, but again, the tech wasn't brilliant. The, the tech for the video was actually incredible for this one. I, I had it, They had the unusually really high quality. It's called an Eagle and it's a tiny box. And for the time, it was brilliant. Tiny box and a wire and the camera and sound was just at the end of a wire. It was really, it's amazing. So you're filming them. There's actually a, a, a lens pointing at the person. Yeah, yeah. So how come that doesn't like twinkle or something? The lens, they can't it see was it. It's tiny. It's so small. It was remarkable. Really? Yeah, it's that small. Yeah, like yeah. You yeah. Still and the, the mic's on the same point as well. Right. Yeah, that, and that was... Um, so it's a little metal box that had to be downloaded. It was it was remarkable. Yeah. But the recording the phone calls was done on um, not a wire, not a uh, what you would call a facility in the UK. Uh, it would just use the donut. It's called a donut, and it would just be attached to the phone, and then in a donut shape, and then to a, re a basic recording device. Mm. So then you go through the procedure of 
exhibiting that recording before you did it and then did it. Mm -hmm. Tricky thing to do on plot. So it'd be like, I'd, I'd do it, um, get one of the backup team to get do it on a vehicle or something and then drop me off or something like that. Um, I didn't do that many recordings of the phone conversations, I don't think. So what is the criteria for the amount of evidence you need on the Burger Bar Boys before your job is done? Um, well, the main thing, intent, and the main thing for those and those kind of operations is to get evidence of conspiracy uh, because that is can be stronger in course and it can also look, mean bigger sentences. And also it helps with evidence of other peripheral people involved as well. So it would be conversations, um, evidence of phone number, you know, phone data, that kind of thing. And building a picture over time of their movements and the communications between them. Um, so you take time to build up a picture. And, but I mean, quite often you could see it in simple terms that, well, you've got enough evidence against somebody if you've got three corroborated buys individually or three corroborated instances of offences. But I was getting 20, 30 instances off some of them because it was about building up the bigger picture. Because also, I, you know, I would be connected and, and uh, buying off other people connected to them as well. I was where it was safe to do so. I was networking in a, in a broader sense. And by the end of the operation, there was a couple of other people involved as well. But there were 96 people in Northampton roped on top into the, into the evidence of that whole operation. 96. It's not that big a place, Northampton. But after seven months, the criteria really for deciding that the job was over, that there was no one else to find. There was no other dealers to get to know, no other connected people, no other runners, no phone numbers to get. Everybody involved in that trade in Northampton we'd got in the bag. We thought we're going to wipe out the trade overnight. We've got so many people. Um, and it was a massive, expensive operation, actually. They got help from five. There were five constabularies cops. They got help from all the surrounding areas. Massive raids, all the burger bars boys, boys caught. So many other people locked up. Anyway, I had a phone call with the Intel guy that we called two weeks later. And he says, yeah, Woody, um, we've managed to interrupt the heroin and crack cocaine supply in Northampton for a full two hours. Two hours, two hours before there was another phone number on the streets and everyone knew where to go. Two hours. Now, that's not even enough time to rattle. That's not even enough time to rattle because you'd need four hours for that from heroin. But you can imagine the scene though, can't you? I don't know this for certain, but you can imagine the Johnson crew hearing that the burgers had been raided in Northampton and they'd be laughing, thinking, yeah, fantastic. Put the call in. Get an extra load of stuff in now. You know, we're going to make a killing. We'd take over that market, we're du doubling our profit overnight. Thank you, the police. <laughs> That's exactly how I felt when Sammy the Bull, he got arrested a year or two before me. I was like, the police have just done me a favour. I could take all his customers now. Yeah. So in terms of taxpayer expense, how much would an operation like taking the Burger Bar Boys down have cost the taxpayers? Oh, God. I mean... I, the, the numbers maybe I should work try and work out the numbers one day it's quite difficult but I do know it was it is considered the most expensive operation police can do and even though there's been very much a, a rolling back of the amount of expenditure police forces spend on investigating drugs that it has been reduced significantly it's still the biggest slice of the policing budget drugs because there's more arrests and uh, dealings with drugs than anything else so it's the biggest part of the policing budget which is why actually that Durham Durham Constabulary, run by Ron Hogg, and, and it was the, the Chief Constable Mike Barton, mm -hmm. they took the view that, and they announced it publicly, they were not going to be locking up anyone for cannabis possession. They're not going to be doing warrants for grow uh, cannabis grows. Uh, they're not going to be prioritising these things, and they're going to put the res those resources into other things. As a result of that, for four or five, I think it's four years running, they have scored the highest amongst all the constabularies in the UK. They've scored outstanding on every measure because that's where they've put their resources. So there's very clear evidence there that the police can achieve things much better if they if they don't investigate drugs so much. Just from taking money from one drug, cannabis. Just it, Yeah, just cannabis, yeah. And I imagine that is because cannabis is the most commonly used drug. Yeah. 
pretty much everywhere. So the vast amount of resources with all of, all of that, dealing with all of that. Um, and of course, a lot less people in Durham have ended up with criminal convictions that would, would have ruined their lives as well. Yeah. So burger buys, bought bar boys get busted. What kind of sentences? Uh, nine and 10 years each. And they only have to serve 50%? Um, generally do about two thirds, I think. What, um, what about the guy being involved in seven murders? Well, there was no evidence about murders. That's only the intelligence that I can remember seeing. So he was he got 10 years for the conspiracy to supply um, heroin and crack. So no evidence against him for rapes or maimings. They only got sentenced for the, um, for the drugs. So with Epstein getting suicided in prison, I've been asked about all the methods that prisoners you know, can get killed in prison. Yeah. And a, pr a method that the gang employ is to just overdose a prisoner with heroin because mm. then it just looks like another addict has took too much drugs. There's no investigation. There's nothing. Yeah. One of the interesting things I read in your books was you notice this pattern in Brighton. Yes. Now, um, Brighton, I should set the scene really because most of the cops I'd worked with around the country was there were some really intelligent professional people, brilliant people in Nottinghamshire, Northamptonshire, really, really good people wherever I'd worked, uh, worked, you know, doing the wrong kind of work, but they didn't know that yet. And they were, well, they maybe don't know that, but they were well-meaning. The cops I worked for in Brighton, they were a different breed altogether. They were obnoxious. They were a small team who had been doing this kind of undercover work, but in a very low level sense, old school sense, and they've been overusing the tactic, like in in a simple terms, way overusing it. And I was sent down there to to try and revive their operation because they weren't having quite the success. And what struck me about these people is, now police, you can have a a real canteen culture. It can be harsh. There can be harsh humour, um, dark humour. But these were a bit different. Um, you know, they, they, for example, someone would overdose on heroin uh, that they knew and they would just joke that, oh, maybe, maybe shoplifting will go down today. You know, it's just another dead smackhead. And that, that was, it, it was uncomfortable. But apart from their attitude, you know, the, the guy who ran the team was a bit of a, bit of a bully and it was just an unpleasant environment. You know, the briefings, it's just horrid. But I went out, dutifully went, you know, try and figure the place out. And uh, wherever you go, you have to get a feeling of, of the place. You know, you have to walk around the streets and speak to people and observe people and how people are behaving. Now, at the time, Brighton had the highest drug deaths per capita than anywhere else in the country, which is quite typical of seaside towns. They tend to have the biggest drug deaths. Uh, but it was by a long way, by a long way, and they had had for seven years running. And there was a big difference between them and the next highest in Blackpool. And the place was just grim. The underbelly of Brighton was so, so dark. I mean, the, the homelessness obviously was huge, but just the street people, the people hung around on the streets, maybe lived in squats and hung around in those cliques. You know, there was just a dark mood. And very quickly, I found it was very different to any, anywhere else. Anyway, eventually I got talking to some people um, and some of the people I got to know, not all of them, but some of the people I got to know were, were, were very, very convinced that recent overdose deaths that were recorded as overdose were murders. Very convinced of this, very convinced. And I fed this back to the team and they just, they just laughed at me. It says, you know, junkies die every day. What the fuck are you talking about? Don't be so stupid. Why would they do that? Why would they kill the customers? Are you thick? So I carried on working and, and the problem is, whereas I could buy second hand from homeless people, that's with the way you start an operation, but you have to get introduced and move to the gangsters. Otherwise, what's the point? But the team I was working for were quite happy to just catch homeless people because as far as they were concerned, if they sell you drugs, they're a dealer. My argument was, well, they're not a dealer. They're not dealers. They're, they're just homeless people. But for them, it was just numbers. So I'm trying to get to the gangsters. And it was explained to me by several people, you don't get close to the gangsters here. 
There's three gangs. Sal here. There are a few local people, but generally there's three gangs. There's one from Liverpool, one from Birmingham, and one from London. And as much as the country's run now, much, much you know, around the country. And um, they have designated a point of contact or a certain point of contact. And one of them's me for this gang, he says. If I bring you even close to their car when I go meet them, they've, they've told me they'll kill me. And they've told me that they've done that to other people and I know that guy they're talking about. So I'm not going to piss them off. I'm going to do as I'm told. And the way they were working is he would take all the orders from, say, eight people, take all the money, and then put the call in, go to meet them, and then come back to that group of people and dish it out. So he becomes the proxy dealer, the buffer zone between any undercover cops and, and them. Quite smart, really. Basic strategic response to a repetitive problem because they'd overuse the tactic. So I explained this and they, they weren't impressed at all. They thought, you know, you, you we thought you meant to have a good reputation. What are you doing? You're a bit shit really, aren't you? Um, but it was, it was incredibly depressing because whereas I cannot say there were casual murders, I can't because there would have to be a full investigation in order to determine that. But what I would say is the people I was reporting to were not willing to even consider it. And what I can also say is there were several people I met in Brighton that were completely convinced that casual murders were happening as reputation building is to make sure that that relationship was enforced. So, um, I mean, that was that was really the beginning of, of my mental health problems. I think years of um, near-death experiences, too much adrenaline, um, it, it just made me realise this is the future. There's always going to be a darker tactic. And this is a result of trying harder or overusing a tactic. Then this is the this is what the future looks like. This is the future. You know, this is it's only going in one direction. And the real problem for me emotionally, though, was that when I look back on people like Cammy or the couple that I uh, manipulated in Northampton, I knew I was causing those people harm by manipulating them and enrolling them into my what I was doing. I knew that their lives would be made worse by coming into contact with me. Because when the dust settled, they were the Muppets who introduced the undercover cop. What shit are they going to get? And some of them, you know, they're going to get shit. You know, some of them get sent to prison. They're, they're in trouble. And I knew that. And I knew that I was causing emotional difficulties when I befriended people and betrayed them. I know, I knew. But I justified it to myself. I thought, well, yeah, but I'm going to catch the bad guy. So the end justifies the means. And that's that. I kept going with that. I actually spent time thinking of the ethics. I did. I thought them through in my head and, and, and I agreed to myself to keep going on. So suddenly when I looked at the future in Brighton and I thought, well, no, because this has happened as a result of my actions and other undercover cops. This We've got to this terrifying arms race in this terrible situation where it's just got worse and worse and now people are dying and that's my fault you know you look back on the futility of the burger bar boys and the arrest there but it's worse than futile it's actually it's tangibly been made worse by my actions so that's bad enough to conclude but then i had to then suddenly my mental health took a tumble because then i'm reviewing everything i've done i'm looking back thinking of the harm that i've caused and I've justified it to myself. But of course, it's not justifiable. I've only been causing harm and, and my rationale was, was twisted. And that's really that's really difficult. It was really difficult to deal with. Still is difficult to deal with, to be honest. Because it's the logic of the battlefield, isn't it? You risk somebody, you cause harm to someone to catch someone else. That's like a general saying, right, I'm going to sacrifice that platoon to win the battle. And that's got no place in civil society. And I, and I was part of that infrastructure. So you mentioned your mental health and one of the themes of good cop, bad war is your family. So how did this job affect your relations with your family members? Well, I mean, I had a difficult relationship with my, <clears throat> with my wife anyway. I, I, I realized actually I've got married perhaps unwisely but by that time I'd got two young kids 
And weirdly, it became a relief to escape from the pressures of that marriage working undercover. So it's a bizarre situation that I was going buying crack off the streets and it was a relaxation from home life. Would you have to sometimes spend uh, weeks away from your family completely? Not that often, actually. Uh, I would I would arrange my work so that I would tell people I was having a tolerance break or going thieving somewhere, and I would take you know two or three days off. I mean, some some job operations I would take every weekend off for ages, and I'd still manage to get home and take my kids swimming on a Sunday morning. So that was great. I still had that relationship with my kids, and I'd be reading them a story at uh, weekends and and stuff. So it was a, an incredible contrast between what was going on, and especially at times of extreme uh, risk. But it's comforting to come home and talk to your kids, you know. But was there ever a point where you were with your family and you were out in public and you saw someone? No, no, I've never been. I, I think all of the places I've been deployed was sufficiently distance, uh, sufficient distance away to be to be pretty safe. You know, I worked up as far north as Leeds, as far south as Brighton, lots of places in between, but not that close to books. And perhaps the riskiest one was Stoke, actually, because lots of people do. There is an overlap of families and, you know, people know each other in those towns but but no thankfully not so you got married young you had two kids you're in this job stress is taking its toll on you and that's gonna be fed through to your family that energy is it somehow i don't know no I, I, my home i mean I, I never took any stresses home i don't think um i was quite good at compartmentalizing it and suppressing that stress but perhaps the way that i suppressed that stress caused me more stress at the time because I couldn't talk to my wife about it. Um, I wasn't meant to tell anybody what I was doing, so I couldn't talk to anybody about it. And that was a very clear instruction. You, you can't tell people about this. So They provided no way of discussing it with anyone. Couples come home from work at the end of the day and discuss what they've done. You can't say anything at all. No. No, I can't. No. Wow. So you're internalizing it. And yeah. that's aggravating your mental health yeah i mean it took a long time for it to have that impact uh, and i wasn't even aware at the time that that's that, that i was ad adding to my harm by that sort of insular um situation so it seems as like that your career trajectory is reached in the climax in brighton with the mental health issue and the darkness of what's going on with these hot shots and stuff yeah do you still push this and try and get to meet the gangsters somehow in brighton no, I had to walk away. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I walked away. Uh, I only did two months into that job, I think, uh, which was meant to be six months as a, as a plan. But no, I, I, I had to walk away. Um, I was getting nowhere. And and, and I'd reached a point I'd, I just couldn't, in all conscience, carry on. So at that point, I, I tried to stay in the in the job and change things. A daft thing to think now, really. But I was uh, thinking um, there must be a way I can change things or influence things from the inside. But you can't influence things from inside that big machine. You know, I tried to become part of the international, the national uh, drugs experts to try and influence, because I knew one of them was involved in policy and meeting politicians. So I thought if I maybe get that role, I can start telling the truth from the inside. But the whole machine is just charged up to keep fighting the drug war you know um so what was your new career within the police well i i say i worked over 14 years undercover but i didn't work all the time so i would do seven months and i would go back to conventional detective work for a few months and then i would do another operation so i qualified as a detective in 2000 i think and um so i did conventional ground level detective work and then i became a detective sergeant so i would supervise uh, serious crime investigations, rapes and things like that. Did you do any homicide investigations? Yeah, I did a few, yeah. Uh, not, but, but homicide murders are, um, they're done in a very particular way in the UK. So you'd be put on a team as part of the outside inquiry team. It's a big team does a murder. The structure of it's quite, quite complicated. You know, you have your homes operators, the computer operators, statement readers, um, your detectives, so then you'd have a senior investigating officer who would direct everything. So it's a big operation of murder in the UK. Are there any murder cases you can describe that you worked on? Um, yeah, there was one horrifying one um, at, at Ashbourne. What was her name? I can remember the offender's name, Mark Deitch. He was the he was the murderer. 
And this was a really tragic one because um, it was police incompetence which which led to this woman getting murdered. Mm. Um, syst- potent- I mean, I don't know how systematic it was. I can't, I can't remember what the investigation into the police actually concluded, but I know one person got sacked um, and the person got disciplined. But essentially, it was a domestic violence problem. This girl, a uh, very middle class uh, background in Ashbourne. And um, she'd been going out with this 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 guy, Mark Deitch, and um, she decided that he was a bit creepy and she wanted to break it off. And he didn't he didn't like that. He didn't he, he saw her as property. And um, he was hassling her with phones and threats and threats by proxy. And she kept reporting this to the police that she was scared of various instances. And there was recordings of harassment on the on the system no particular evidence of any investigation into that harassment and this kept happening and then one day she uh, was driving into her village her car park where she lived in her village and there were four men waiting for her who beat her with baseball bats and the only thing that they took was a watch which had been given to her a very expensive watch given to her by Mark Deitch this was reported to detectives now I know it's easy to say with hindsight, but it doesn't matter. I I know as a detective what I would have done instantly there. There was only one suspect for that. I'd have in, instantly got a warrant for his house and and gone to arrest him. It's, there's no, you know, it's not it's not complicated who it's likely to be, is it? In those circumstances, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen, and so uh, sometime later, the next instance was um, she was stopped by a car on a country lane, and her head blown off with a shotgun. And um, it's not unreasonable to suggest that that could have been prevented. Now, don't get me wrong. I've worked with incredibly professional detectives and Derbyshire Constabulary generally are one of the best anywhere. They are brilliant. But it just goes to show that, you know, the system can break down and there was genuine incompetence led to those, that series of um, that, those circumstances and that poor woman's death. How many murder cases did you investigate? Um, trying to think. Not in nine, not in nineteen ninety nine when I was learning to be a detective. Probably four, maybe. And how many of those were solved? Um, all of them. And was it generally like you hear this cliche? It's usually someone the victim knows. Is that did that in your experience? Was that the case? Oh yeah, absolutely. Ninety percent of murders are by someone uh, that's known. I think it's over 90%. And most of those are domestic, yeah. Um, so it's usually, why, it's usually a female victim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the biggest, the, the single biggest um, reason women die worldwide is domestic violence. That statistic was quite was quite recent. It's not surprising, uh, which is why we should be taking domestic violence in far, far more seriously. And also, it brings us back to the war on drugs. All the resources we spend on the war on drugs and women are getting murdered. If and you would, you would be able to safeguard people. You would be able to investigate those harassments more effectively if those resources were directed that way. One of the stats, I don't know, I heard it in a, in a speech by one of the Leap um, speakers, was that since the war on drugs has started, the rate at which murders are solved in America has has, has gone down because there's an incentive to make all these arrests for arrest quotas and stuff, and just you know the easiest people to arrest. Uh, people possessing drugs and then they get more federal funding and more this and more that to finance uh, the department. So there's this like incentive not to solve the murders? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the, mur- the murder detection rate, the murder, murder solving rate is actually a, a very, very important, very important topic. And it's one of, one of my favorite topics that I try and explain actually. Because what happened in America uh, from the point when Nixon re-declared the war on drugs in his aggressive way, at the point that he declared that, the murder detection rate in the United States was 85%. 85%. And it had been that high for quite a while, consistently. Within four years, it dropped to 65%. Within four years. And it's not climbed above that since. Now, if you consider that the 1980s and 90s have had Enormous steps forward in forensic science, both improved fingerprinting technology, uh, the ninhydrin fingerprinting, all that kind of stuff, the DNA techniques, 
All of these adv advances in forensic science should have taken it in the other direction, but it's not improved above 65%. Now I've been predicting that that we will we will suffer that drop in this country, for the same reasons. Now that we're always going to be much slower to to suffer that loss in the United States because we don't have guns on the streets. That's why it was so quick in the states because of the guns. Now I I, I slightly disagree with the reasoning of whoever said that it why that has happened, because to me it's it's quite clear that uh, the most important part of policing in solving crime is connection with the community. And what the war on drugs does is separate police and community. And so there's no flow of information. And as organized crime have become more dominant in those communities, replacing the police connection, then organized crime controls the narrative in those communities. So a murder, if organized crime don't want a murder solved, then, they, then the pressure is them not to talk to the police. So that 20% shift is a numerical shift between the from the power of police to organize crime. Now, I've been predicting it will happen here. And the last announcement of detection rates from the Met started with a statement from Cressida Dick that murders are getting harder to solve. That was the words that she used. Now, traditionally in the UK, we have some of the best murder detection rates in the world, especially considering we have such a big population. It hovers around 90%. 90% for a long, long time. Last announcement, 77%. And that's going to fall. Do you know what the most common method of murder is in the UK? I think it's, um, it's knives, I think. Knives. I think even domestics, even domestics, it's knives, I think. With, with knives. Yeah, and of course the knife crime on the streets has bumped up that statistic. There's been breaking news in the last couple of days that someone has confessed... A murderer in the prison system has confessed to the murder of Teresa Holbach, which Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey are presently doing time for. Have you watched Making a Murderer? No, I haven't. No, okay. No. <laughs> well, that's an interesting confession, though, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So we'll see what develops with that. Yeah. Um, Leap. Who are Leap? Let's 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 tell the people out there. LEAP is the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, and we are a rapidly growing international movement of police and other law enforcement figures who believe the same as I have. They've come to the same conclusions. We're generally people who've been on the front line in the, in the drug war uh, and seen the same kind of things as me and come to the same conclusions. Started in the United States in 2002. Um, there are some wonderful people in LEAP in the United States, people like Diane Goldstein, uh, Neil Franklin, who's the chairman, uh, Lee Maddox, who featured in Johan Hari's Chasing the Scream. There brilliant, some... brilliant book, Chasing the Scream. Really recommend people read that, especially what, what he says about Harry Anslinger and all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Johan's amazing. Well, so Lee, Lee Maddox is the one who features from Leap in there. Uh, and we have spread a lot. You know, in, in the UK, we have former chief constables, security services, military, other undercover cops like me. There's a, there's a few of us now. Um, former DIs. Uh, we have lots of serving police who are speaking to us who want to be members, but they're not quite confident about about doing that yet. Um, but you know, but we're growing rapidly. We uh, two years ago we launched Leap Scandinavia. Now half of their membership are serving police. There's 35 members, six, 16 of them are serving cops. We've even got um, in in Scandinavia. We've even, we've even got criminologists for, who teach the police from Denmark and Norway. Uh, later this year, we launched Leap France. We've got Leap Germany, Leap Australia. We're speaking to sympathetic police all over the place, South Africa. We've got members in Poland. Um, and, and we are growing rapidly. It's, uh, if anyone wants to help us organize, and we, we're, about to, we're about to ask for volunteers for Leap UK, actually, because we need help in all the projects. And how can people do. watch in this video? Do that. Is there a link I can put below this video that people can contact you or get involved somehow? Yeah, well, I mean, the best way that we communicate with the public is is Twitter, I think, because that Twitter tends to be where the drug policy debate goes. You know, uh, politicians are involved in the and, uh, on the debate on there. So our Twitter um, name is at UK Leap. It's the same for Instagram, I believe. We're also active on Facebook, or you can email our website uh, at the support address on the on the website. Um, 
we're not exactly sure how the roles are going to shape up yet, but we 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 are a voluntary organisation. We struggle to get funding, so um, if anybody out there is good at getting funding, is good with social media, or uh, or think they have skills or experience they can offer us that we don't even understand, then uh, then please please do get in touch. And uh, if if you do nothing else, then please follow us on social media and spread the word, because. Um, you know, in, in trying to bring an end to this war on drugs, I do spend a lot of time speaking to politicians. I mean, I was actually I was at the Labour Party conference yesterday, speaking at a well attended event. Next week, I'm at the Conservative conference. So, you know, we do a lot of political advocacy, and that is important. But what's more important than politicians is everyone out there, because if 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 you agree with us that this is a crisis and we have to end the drug war. We need to regulate the drug markets and take the power away from organised crime. If you agree with us, then you are part of the social movement. And it's the social movement that's important because this is the social movement that drives politics. And the social movement is actually growing rapidly. It really is. But if you look at other social movements in history, social justice issues, uh, okay, homosexuality, for example, was illegal. And then after it was made legal, there was still massive prejudice. And you'd watch some comedy in the 1970s, and it's brutally unkind to gay people. But society has changed. But it's changed through social movement, not from leadership, really. And sometimes it, it, it's hard to put your work, your finger on exactly where the tipping point comes for something like that. But we're reaching the tipping point. And anybody out there can help us reach that tipping point if you if you just join the social movement, explain this to other people, point other people to this podcast to listen to it, get people to listen, get people to read the books, get people to follow us on social media. And all those links are going to be in the description box below this video. So what do you think about the hypocrisy of key politicians in the war on drugs, like Clinton, notorious cocaine user and abuser, his brother Roger was arrested uh, and undercover, um, sold him cocaine. He's talking about like Bill having a nose like a vacuum cleaner. And then Clinton gets in power and there are hundreds of thousands of nonviolent drug offenders getting incarcerated. Record number of women getting put into the American prison system, feeding all these private prisons. How can you make progress with people who are just have these hip hypocritical uh, double standards like that? Well, it makes it really difficult, doesn't it? I mean, I would be cautious with the anger, though. That, that's 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 what I would say because if you if you bring it to the UK uh, perspective, being angry merely about the hypocritical nature of it, being angry just about Johnson having used cocaine or Gove having used cocaine or whoever it is, just being angry about it, that's not necessarily helpful. What we need is to use that narrative to explain and help the social movement grow that drug use is normal. It's normal. Politicians do it. For all levels of society, there will be people for, for whatever reason they're into a particular drug. You know, uh, it, whether it's tens of thousands of people at Boomtown want to drop a pill and dance to some dance music, it's normal. It's normal human behaviour. And that's the narrative we need to have. That's what we, what we need to say. And actually, in the UK, there's beginnings, there's the hint of that starting to happen because in the question time that came after some re revelations about, I think it was the Michael Gove one, in question time, it was absolutely astonishing because you got um, a panel of politicians and I think it was a, a Plaid Cymru politician, I can't remember his name now, said, well, I have to out myself as a gay man who used to go clubbing in the 90s. And he says, it would be pretty weird if I hadn't used drugs. And he was basically saying, yeah, I used drugs without any problem through the 90s and I loved it. And then it went to the next person on the panel, which was Stephen Kinnock from Labour. And he says, well, yeah, I must out myself also as an MDMA user. I used to go clubbing and I really enjoyed it. And it was going around this panel and it's like, what? <laughs> and the point that Stephen Kinnock and the other one was making is drug use is normal. And we need to start having that conversation. Next person also confessed to some drug use and then went to the Conservative member. And it was this utterly bizarre. I'm not one singling out a Tory in particular. It just so happened that she looked a bit uncomfortable at the end. It's this bizarre situation where everyone's expecting, right, all right, your turn. Come on then. And she said, yeah, well, I used a bit of cannabis once at university. Didn't like it. 
but it was almost like she couldn't say nothing. And that is a remarkable moment. It is genuinely a remarkable moment where enough hypocrisy, as when asked the question, those politicians are saying, yeah, I used drugs, I enjoyed them and they didn't cause me any harm. That's what we want from our politicians and that's what we want more of. Because what Rick Ross was pointing out, I mentioned the big time California dealer, um, what he points out now after he's been released is the fact that, you know, his cocaine supplier was sponsored by the CIA and the, the, the coke, the crack was targeting these black neighborhoods and then they were getting these life sentences for small amounts of crack, the black population, and, and that it doesn't get more hypocritical to, than that. But my question for you is, looking at some of the Scandinavian countries, I think one or two of those has taken drug policy out the hands of politicians because the Nixon model like you described, I have to be tough on crime to get votes. If I say I've done drugs or I'm soft on drugs, even though I have done drugs, I'm going to lose votes. So I've got to be tough on crime and we've got to put people away for, for drug use, fighting this war on drugs. Take it out the hands of the politicians, then have someone independent in charge of drug policy, you're going to get them saying, all right, we've got to do the harm reduction. We can't keep going with this. Now, I had a narco journalist on, Johan Grillo, and we had a long chat at the end of it, and he was like, how do we move this forward? Do you think that would be a way to move this forward in this country? Has it got to come through to politicians? That's a really interesting question. I was only discussing this in some detail last night, actually, uh, with some with some politicians. And what you're referring to in Scandinavia is Norway, who've decided to assemble a panel of experts to decide. They've already decided that they intend to have some form of decriminalisation, though. So they've already decided that, and they've got some panels to decide the best model for them to do that. And, of course, in Portugal, the reason that they decriminalise is because politicians said, we've got to de take the politics out of this. And the government said, we're going to assemble a... They didn't, des they didn't say exactly what they wanted, but they said, we're going to get some experts and whatever they decide, no conditions, we'll accept it and do it. So yeah, perhaps that is the way that we have to do it and depoliticize it. But what's happening, but you have to get some kind of consensus that change is needed first. And, and that is now happening. So the, the Lib Dems and the Greens have had some progressive drug policies already for a while. They acknowledge the need for change. But now what we have is internal campaigns happening with the Labour Party and the Conservatives. So there's the drug, uh, Labour Drug Policy Reform Group, which is run by Jeff Smith and Thangam Debonair, another good group to follow on Twitter. And there's the Conservative one run by Crispin Blunt. Um, again, really worth following on, on, on Twitter and supporting. And they are basically campaigning within their own party to bring that party to the point where they need to adopt some kind of reform policy. And what that reform policy looks like will be debated further. But only a few days ago, um, there was a clear success from the Labour campaign because the front bench decided, um, Diane Abbott stated that the Labour Party would commission a royal, have a royal commission to decide it. So that's effectively what they're saying, that they'll do what you just suggested, that they'll have a panel of experts, which is encouraging. I think that's the wrong way to go here because it would take too long. And this is bloody urgent. We can't wait for a Royal Commission. The evidence is there already. And this is one of the frustrating things. You know, we've got the scientific evidence of how harm, which drugs are harmful. We know how to regulate. We've been, we're, people have been working on this for a long, long time. Transform Drug Policy Foundation published a, a book called Blueprint for Regulation uh, years ago. Experts know the answers, they know the evidence, and we need some leadership because in the UK it's really urgent. You know, in Norway they can sit back and wait, but in the UK we've got 10,000 kids dealing drugs, and you can end that overnight by prescribing heroin. 80% of the county lines market is about heroin. So you mentioned the arms race. Is the county line strategy a reaction within the arms race? It's and, the, and can you explain to people who don't understand what that means? What is the county lines? Right, county lines is what's, hap what's happened uh, in the last few years is that uh, gangs, now gangs like the Birmingham gangs, London, London gangs, like the Burger Bar boys, have moved into another town and take over the dealing there. Yeah. Now they're using children to do it. They're using children. They're grooming them. 
11, 12 years old uh, or 13, they're meeting them through the teenage cannabis market. Uh, what a gang will typically do is, for example, they'll lay on a, a quarter ounce to uh, or half an ounce to a teenager of cannabis and say, well, come back when you've sold that. You can I'll lay it on. You pay me when you've sold it. And they make a few quid. Then the best ones who sell the weed, then they'll, they'll, they'll recruit them into heroin and crack trading. Or they'll just blackmail people. They'll they'll film them in sexualized positions and force them to to, to sell drugs and travel around the country. And I spoke to this one kid who who uh, was dealing dealing for a gang in Liverpool. He was dealing in Aberdeen. He's going all the way to Aberdeen to deal. And the purpose of sending them across the county lines is what? Well, it, for one, it's it's an expansion of the monopolies. So where in the cities the market is saturated, and you you know you want to find new customers and expand your part of the monopoly then the lucrative markets are uh, other towns where you can be more dominant you can be more aggressive and you can take them over you can cut out the competition with better quality and cheaper drugs it's just expanding monopolies that's the way the business works but the reason that they're now, now that they're now using children to do this is my fault or people like me because when I caught the Burger Bar Boys I caught Adults, I caught adults who were hands-on with the drugs, hands-on with the money, and doing all the business themselves, driving from Birmingham to Northampton. So they got caught. And this arms race where organized crime constantly adapts to police methods means that the natural strategic response to the success that I had and other kinds of success that police had is using children. It's a natural strategic response because... A child becomes a buffer zone. You know, like the homeless person who's a buffer zone in Brighton? Well, they've moved on from homeless people to children. There's a buffer zone. Children are easy to recruit, disposable. They're really difficult for police informants to get information on because they don't move in those circles. So they're separate from police informants and normal police tactics. They're disposable, easy to manipulate, cheap labour. They don't have to pay them as much. And there's an endless supply of them. So this is a cause of police tactics. That's what's brought us here. This is what success looks like. You know, I keep repeating this phrase that police are really ca good at catching drug dealers. They don't change the shape. They don't change the size of the market. They change the shape of it. And that changing shape means that we now have 10,000 children dealing drugs for gangsters in the UK. Now, I'd call that not complicated in history, not complicated to understand, not really. And the solutions are there. We can present the evidence for the solutions. And they are urgent because these children are being traumatised. I mean, even if you have a successful operation, you know, sometimes now the police have started saying, uh, you occasionally in a, f a few weeks you get the police announcing that we've, yeah, we've shut down a county lines gang and we've rescued 28 children from exploitation. Great. Yeah, fantastic. You've rescued 28 children. But that means 28 new ones have been groomed. So it's just perpetuating the same violence towards our young. And it, we have to stop doing this. We, we have to be honest. Police have to be honest about it. Police have to step up now. And if there's any police listening to this, you know. You know this isn't working. And, you know, it's, I know police are meant to be apolitical, but there's plenty of your colleagues speaking out and joining us. Oddly enough, I had a policeman come up to me in the restaurant and said, I, I watch your podcast. I'm a policeman. And um, what you're saying about the war on drugs is right, but, you know, I can't say anything. So my next question is, you're talking about this evolving, changing shape. Is the spice epidemic a function of that? Because I do talks in prisons in the UK. I get letters from prisoners in America. And the whole prison systems in both countries are awash. Mm. with spice right now which is causing people to wig out staff assaults are up prisoners are attacking each other people are falling downstairs flopping like fish what what are your thoughts on that well spice uh, basically is a product of cannabis prohibition it's a synthetic cannabinoid and they wouldn't really have existed on the streets if cannabis had been legally regulated several years ago having said that now it's become an entirely different animal it's a it's a substantially different beast and it suits the prison population and vulnerable people because it's cheap, very cheap to produce and incredibly strong. And 
there'll probably be a few people out there who already understand the difference between the synthetic cannabinoids and cannabis. But um, in layman's terms, I'll just explain it if it's helpful. Cannabis is a, um, a partial agonist of this endocannabinoid system partial so it doesn't completely bind with the with the kind of cannabinoid receptors the more dangerous spice is a total agonist so it completely binds to the receptors what that means is you can't overdose on cannabis no one's overdosed on cannabis you can't kill yourself with it spice you can overdose and die because it's a much stronger much more problematic uh, set of chemicals and there's lots of different types of spice and yeah, it, it, it's a nightmare. It is. But you could regulate even spice because there are types of spice which are partial agonists. So if you had a legally regulated version of it, people wouldn't be dying from it. And obviously one of the most problematic populations who use spice are homeless people. Now, I have to say, having spent a lot of time with homeless people, if I found myself on the streets, I would definitely be getting high to cope with it. I have no doubt about that. I do not know how I would cope with that otherwise. And spice is very a very rational choice drug, actually, to use on the streets because it takes time out of the day. It's cheap and it takes time out of the day. It makes complete sense. Why would you not do that if you're on the streets struggling with... I mean, what do you do? You have to str struggle and go with the, the stress of begging and getting enough money just to function and eat and maybe get a bit of spice. Then what do you do with your time? So it's a rational reaction to a horrible situation. Would you say that the police profession, they are hard drinkers? Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a huge drinking culture in the police. And what is the drug that kills the most young people in this country? Uh, alcohol. Yeah, the, but there are 8,500 um, acute alcohol deaths, as in overdose deaths, each year in the UK, around 8,500. 8 so that's not the long-term harms, cancer and heart disease and all those kinds. That's, that's acute deaths. I know three young people at least a week die just from binge drinking alone. Yeah, they're in the figures, but it's terrible young people do that. So you've got people who participate in the drug that kills the most people arresting mm -hmm. people who participate in a drug that is less harmful. Would, would that be correct? To say? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that is the twisted dynamic, yeah. And you've got the prosecutors and the judges who probably drink as well and take prescription pills and they're putting young people in prison for weed possession. It's moral relativism. Uh, it's, it, it is, absolutely. You know, I, I went to, I got invited to speak to an event, a really posh event in, um, in Cambridge by a friend of mine who's a former chief constable. And it was an international law enforcement sort of event. And it was at, uh, was it Christ College College? One of the posh colleges anyway, in this medieval hall. And um, this posh dinner, and I thought, well, you know, they, they, they realise they've got such a such a yokel in here. Um, and there were three glasses. And um, one, so someone come and poured a white and a red. I'm thinking, oh, I don't really drink red. And... And this, this guy, this waiter pouring it, and he says, oh, you'll need it for the toasts. And there was a most bizarre, after the food, the most incredible ritualistic, basically, drinking session that I've ever seen. And it was obviously posh, Cambridge, academics, top police from around the world. And there was a series of toasts, and everyone's just knocking back a load of wine with every toast. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, charge your glasses. That was the sort of ritual before. And I'm thinking, you know, you just, you just, I could, in my brain, I was just comparing this to every other little, like, heavy drug session ritual that might be going on around the world, you know, for someone who really wants to cane it for the evening, you know, that you're going to do, I'm going to do another rock. I'm going to, I'm going to cane, I'm going to do like a session on rocks. And I'm just thinking, charge, you know, how did that work? Charge your glasses, charge your rocks. I don't know. And it was really intense. And people were getting ridiculously pissed very quickly in a very, old school, white, privileged ritual. Do you think it's just human nature then that societies, populations of people will always divide and, and one group will always brutalize another group and that's really, the war on drugs is an extension of that really. Whether it's religion, politics, you can go back through history, societies have sent, tend to have structured themselves around that. So the group you just described would look at, you know, people taking drugs as a kind of enemy or bad people mm. that, that, that that's how they form 
Yeah, absolutely. But of course, the war on drugs is, has its origins completely in, in racism. That's always been about racism. Uh, the war on drugs was gifted to us all by the United States. And it started with very, very specific racism to very specific groups of people. So it started with the um, the Chinese immigrants who built the railways in America, a uh, couple of hundred thousand workers. Well, once the railways were finished and built in over in California, they'd got this huge uh, South Asian population. And uh, the white workers didn't want that competition. You know, the white people didn't want it. So they demonized what they saw as the habits of the yellow people, opium smoking banned it and then persecuted them that's why they banned opium um and there's there's some awful tele uh newspaper articles that show the the time that the, the comments at the time that you know what greater shame to a white man to see his, a, a white woman um near this yellow person you know that kind of horrible i've awful. seen some of the posters from that era where it's they've got just, like these ming the merciless characters it's like it, puppet masters over these white women they're luring into the opium dens and getting them into the sex trade that was it's, it it's hideous and then of course you go to you go to the 1919 and um cocaine was only banned because in the south it was a way to oppress black people that's that's why it was banned and I, it, people i've said this to so many people and they say no surely not Drugs are banned because of the harms, but but they're not. There has never been any evidence about the harms in order to formulate drug laws. There still isn't, actually. Our Misuse of Drugs Act has no basis in evidence at all. So in the South, they didn't want to give up slavery, and they had the Jim Crow laws, the oppression of that minority, and banning cocaine was just another tool to oppress that minority. And some of those blacks had been put on the cocaine by the, the bosses to increase their productivity, to give them more energy. Yeah, yeah, more than likely. And then they 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 smoke weed um, to come down at the end of the day, so they were able to then incarcerate for weed possession and cocaine possession. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the Mexicans, of course, Mexicans coming into America during the Great Depression, they were seen as the immigrant workers stealing white jobs. So cannabis was a way of oppressing them, and they even changed the name because they used to call it cannabis in the mid twenties in America. They changed the name to marijuana to make it sound more foreign and and make it more efficient to oppress Mexicans. We'll have to see if we can get Johan Harry on the podcast. If people are out there and they're friends with him or you want to tweet him, send him some messages. Because a lot of people have come on because of you guys out there and you like suggested it to them. Can we just go, because we, we skipped this, to the day of your resignation? What was that like? Uh, that was that was stressful because um, that was a mess. I'd been off sick for six months. Um, and I was struggling. I didn't really understand what was wrong with me. Um, I was just a gibbering mess, constantly anxious. And um, I wasn't dealt with very well by the constabulary because they didn't really understand either. And the police still don't adequately understand um, complex PTSD. Um, so I was just a, I was a bit of a gibbering mess and I was terrified of the future, worried about money, finances, that kind of thing. But I did feel a sort of sense of relief as well, though, to be free of um, being part of that machine. So perhaps that was the very beginning of my journey to feeling less unwell. I'm not completely there yet, but... <laughs> how did your colleagues view your transition, how you now perceive the work they were doing as counterproductive? <laughs> When I first went public, it was quite clear I was public enemy number one to covert police. How, how long betw between the time you resigned and you went public was there in that space? Probably just less than two years. Less than two years. Yeah, yeah. And you went public by issuing statements or was your book coming out around this? Or I did an interview for Vice. An interview for Vice, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, there was it, a lot of people freaked. Um, and I, I heard that um, my only real, very close friend in the police was called into a senior officer's office and given a lawful order to have nothing to do with me at all and have no further contact with me. Um, she was ordered there and then to remove me from social media and the phone as well, there and then. Uh, I only heard from somebody else sort of secondhand that that's what had happened. So they were out to get me, but that was to punish me. And um, and then I published the book, and it it it, it was 
quite intense. I got lots of insults and horror and accusations of of um, being a traitor, that kind of thing, because I was letting out some, you know, it's a whistleblowing book. When you say they were out to get you, what could they possibly have done to you after you were no longer working for them? Well, they could go after people I knew and make life difficult for them like they did um, for that person. But I mean... Did you ever fear that something bad could happen to you? No, not really. Um, I remember discussing it with Annie Marchand, actually, um, because when I got involved with Leap, she's one of the people I spoke to, and she was a great source of um, knowledge and comfort, really, because she, you know, I don't know if you know her story, but she was in MI5, and she was a whistleblower for some of the activities of what MI5 did. And it was a big news story, and she went on the run, on the run, really. Oh well, perhaps we can get her on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, Annie's incredible. I mean, she's she's just a, she's amazing. Um, so, um, so she she explained, you know, you're best in plain sight. The louder you can be, uh, the clearer you can be. That then that that's the best way. That's the best tactic for you to do. And, and of course, that's what I wanted to do anyway. Not because, not because I wanted to be public. And actually, I I'm I'm not comfortable public. I'm not. You know, the last couple of days I've been wearing. I thought I'd be a mess today because. So I'm please I'm not, because I had to meet lots of people and I'm an introvert and sometimes that can really cause me some real problems. Uh, so I don't really want to be public. I don't. I'm an introvert and I don't necessarily enjoy meeting loads of people but but i have to do it don't i, I i'm i am duty bound to do this so once you're committed to that that fact then you just have to get on with it don't you and manage and manage things i think and here you are in the public today and there's a lot of people going to watch this and what would you like to say to those people in conclusion i'd like to say please consider the evidence um, of 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 what um sean and i say uh, please read the books to inform yourselves, but most importantly, spread the word. If you support us, if you su if you agree that this is a disaster that needs sorting out with some urgency, then to, then be part of the social movement. Be active wherever you can, you know, even if it's just sharing tweets, being in engaged. But you know, write to your MP. I'm very much at Leap UK. We're very much involved in an organisation called Transform Drug Policy Foundation and uh, their campaign arm which is called anyone's child and we do lots of speaking events so I've, you know i will share a stage with a, a grieving mother or father who've lost who's lost a child to, to drugs and they're saying the same as us that we need to regulate the drug markets to protect our children from the drugs and organized crime and that's a powerful combination so but what they always say it transformed to an audience is write to your mp because if an mp receives three letters on one topic they will take it seriously. There's been studies to say that. I've spoken to lots of MPs and say, yeah, if they receive emails on this, they'll sit up and take notice. And if there's anybody out there who thinks, if you think you can host an event, either just a Leap UK event or a joint Leap and Anyone's Child event, then host one, you know, talk to us, arrange it. We, the more we get out there, we speak, speak to local populations, local women's institute groups, you know, it, it, wherever it is. You know, last week I was in Carmarthen in West Wales um, I, I'm going to be in Manchester and Salford. We do constant events, but the more we do, the better. But we need support from people out there willing to put them on because I'm crap at making what I do commercial. I really am. But uh, but I struggle through with how people help us. And I will never turn down a speaking event. Um, I'll never turn down an interview with a local newspaper. Um, and neither will my colleagues at Leap UK. There's a lot of us active out there. So anyone out there watching this then, if you're in a position to help or support Neil, all the links are in the description box below this video. Highly recommend both of his books, Good Cop, Bad War and Drug Wars. You know, like I said at the beginning of this video, brought tears to my eyes when you, you get the full force of the journey that Neil has, has gone through when you read the whole thing. Big shout out to all of the new subscribers and please put your comments down let us know what you thought about today's podcast huge thank you to all the people who've donated to keep the true crime podcast going all the donation links are in the description box below this video as well if you've not subscribed yet it's free there's a little box in the corner right there saying subscribe just click on that and do, do you know the arizona prison handshake no i don't know <laughs> that that and bump fists all right okay <laughs> cheers cool. neil thank you thank you very yeah. much